On? Yeah, it is now. Thanks very much. Um, good morning, all. Nice to see you. Looking forward to today. Um, I'm Felicia Marcus. I'm chair of the board. And today is Tuesday, May 1st at 9.31 a.m. And the meeting is called to order. Uh, with me are, to my left, Vice Chair Stephen Moore. To his left, Board Member Didi Dadamo. To my right, Board Member Tam Dodak. And to her right, Board Member Joaquin Esquivel. Ms. Sobek, will you introduce the staff that's assisting today? Yes, good morning. Um, to my left is Chief Counsel Michael Lauffer. To my right are my two chief deputies, John Bishop and Eric Oppenheimer. Um, clerk, of the, clerk to the board, Janine Townsend, is, is here and assisting her today is Courtney Tyler. Great. Um, emergency evacuation procedures. Um, in the unlikely event that you hear a alert sound, which is unmistakable as an emergency sound. Um, find the exit nearest you, look for it now, P take your stuff, take your friends, and proceed carefully down the stairs. Um, we meet at the corner of 10th and J, if you want to wait with us for the all clear. There have been a lot of fire drills lately, but they haven't affected this floor, but um, it, it, they haven't gotten to this floor yet, I think, so it could happen. Um, uh, that's, yeah, if you wait with us, you'll know when the all clear is, and if you need help, uh, there'll be somebody wearing orange or one of us to help you to a protected area on this floor. Um, the meeting is being webcast and recorded, um, so it is important when you get up to the microphone to make sure that it's on and to speak into it. You don't get so close as to be rock star so that it'll, it picks up a static noise on the other side, but get close enough that it gets picked up so that folks on the webcast can hear and that it's on the recording, which I think we'll want to be sending people to in the future. So I really want this one recorded well. And the last item is if you have a noise making device of any kind, please set it to silent or off so that it doesn't disturb everyone or anyone. Uh, with that done, we're on to the public forum part of our agenda, which is when we hear from anyone who has something to say about something that is not already on the agenda, and we do not have any today. All right, next uh, minutes from the April 17th board meeting. Do I have a motion? Move adoption of the minutes. Second. Any additions or corrections? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That's taken care of. Items two through four are on the uncontested calendar. Again, that doesn't mean they're not important to us. It just means uh, if there's no one who wishes to speak on them, we can move quickly to our other items. Do I have a motion on items two through four? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, and thanks Thank you. to the staff and everyone who did all the work on those. All right. Item number five, a perennial favorite. The weather pages have replaced the sports pages for all of us as a must read every day. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning, my name is Vadim Demchik, engineer with the Division of Water Rights, and with me today is Chris Kwan, a scientist within the division, and we're here to present item number five, the hydrology update of the Bay Delta watershed. Um, just as a reminder, the final water supply index forecast for water year 2018 will be released uh, in a week or so, so right now we're looking at below normal for this water year according to the 50% exceedance forecast. And going back, looking at the precipitation numbers for uh, Northern Sierra, just as a reminder, the shaded blue is the average accumulation that we, be, we would expect for the eight station and some of the other notable years are on, on, in these other colors. And we're specifically looking at the dark blue line, which is this water year, and we're at 38.5 inches, which is 82% of average for this date, about an inch up from the last update. For the Central Sierra, we're at 29.3 inches, 81% of average for this date. And here in the Southern Sierras, we're at 17.3 inches, 66% of average for this date. Hmm. 
This is the snow and water content as of last Friday, going from top to bottom, bottom is northern central and southern Sierras. Um, since our last update, the statewide snowpack has lost about 2.5 inches for snow water content. So we're sitting at 37% of average for a statewide snowpack for this date. Mm. So of course, we're seeing that snow melt and it's now declining. This is a look at reservoir conditions as of last Friday. Again, kind of topping off for the season. Um, most of these major reservoirs are at ab above or at that average. Um, we're, this will obviously change as we continue on here as we start releasing for Delta standards and deliveries. Um, because we have little snowpack to really back these reservoirs, hopefully we can manage this more conservatively going on through the second half of the water year. That's the hope there. Zooming into Lake Shasta, again, the shaded blue is the average fill and drafting over the course of the water year. There's some notable years here in the other colors, but we're specifically looking at the blue line, which is this water year. We're at 4.2 million acre feet. Um, again, 108% of historical average above average. We're close to where we were off the previous water year in that black color there. Uh, we're no longer under the course flood control requirements, but I don't think we'll be filling up to the top this year. Um, we're getting close to that capacity, but like I said, again, we're not, I don't think we'll be filling up to the very top. Releases have ramped up to 6,000, 7,000 CFS range um, recently to meet those demands downstream as well as temperature control management for Shasta. Folsom Lake, we're at 840,000 acre feet. Similar story right above average for this time of year, but nearing that peak of the reservoir level curve um, expected for this time of year. Uh, releases have been 2,300 CFS, pretty consistent over the last week or so, just releasing at 2,300 CFS. Lake Oroville, of course, the one that really stands out. We haven't been accumulating as much as we would have liked because of the spillway construction that's going on, about 1 million acre feet short than we would have liked for, for, for now. San Luis Reservoir kind of lining up to that average. Mm -hmm. um, good. Uh, we are at 84% of operational capacity for the federal share, uh, excuse me, for the state share. We're at 84% of operational capacity and 90% of operational capacity for the federal share. Good. Lake Kachuma, 38% of capacity and 45% of average. Again, we're We'll be looking into other water years, not just the previous year, to see, you know, if there's more than just the mountains that surround that area. Maybe there's some kind of requirements that have changed over, over the course of last oh, year. Oh, thank you. So that be it. Just would be interesting. Continue to, to look know. at this interesting uh, reservoir. So yeah. Oh, and, and, and not just requirements that have changed, but uh, maybe some operational decisions um, mm -hmm. that they've made and for us to get a better understanding of why, because I understand there may be some discretionary um, actions that have been taken. Okay, yeah, that's definitely on our radar. By the county. And, and also there's two other reservoirs owned by Santa Barbara and Monticello, or yeah, um, that, that are um, operated independently and in part of the system. They, they may be full, I'd be interested in, to yeah. see what their status is as upstream. Yeah, no, this is definitely an interesting subject here, and we'll be looking into this with Chris here. The mystery of Kachuma Reservoir. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll change the slide for this. <laughs> uh, Diamond Valley, we're at 89% of capacity. So not much change with these two reservoirs from the last presentation that we had. You've seen this figure before. It's the California-Nevada Climate Applications Program, which gives us a more holistic look of the o overall system. It looks at reservoir normals plus snowpack normals and uh, looking at how the year is uh, turning out here in the red and the orange colors. So that orange, I think it's an orange color there, it's showing that reservoir plus snowpack for this year 
of course, we're starting to level off and we'll probably start dipping down as we get that snow melt. Um, again, as I said before, thanks to a successful 2017 water year and a wet March, that, that red line really, that reservoir base has really propped up that total overall picture. Of course, it's um, maybe a little misleading. We don't have that groundwater picture in this as well, but I did present a few months ago or a few, I guess a month or two ago, and it would be good to revisit that, that slide, the groundwater uh, supply side of it, uh, just because we did recover from 2016 in terms of groundwater, but the overall picture of groundwater is definitely a, the dry, dry is a new norm for groundwater. I have some questions on this. I'm, I'm not really tracking it. So the gray, the, the bump, mm -hmm. reservoir plus snowpack normals, and then the gold line reservoir plus snowpack, and then the red line reservoir normal. Mm -hmm. So it's. Blue's normal for reservoirs, and the reservoirs are Just a little reservoirs. higher because the snowpack's melted into it, what we had. Yeah, so blue is the reservoir normal for, you know, the, the range, I'm not, 2000, to 2015 normals is the, the range that we're looking, we're looking at. So blue is the reservoir normals, the gray is reservoir plus snowpack normals, and then the orange and red are what we're looking at for this year. Okay, So like I said, we're, we're kind of leveling off and we'll probably be seeing this thing dip down soon. You're doing such a good job of this, might have you start adding the Colorado onto it. <laughs> Uh, drought numbers hardly moved from the last update. Not much has changed. We still have that extreme drought in Imperial County. The short-term outlook for temperature is showing higher odds, or uh, so, sorry, um, yeah, so it's looking at higher odds for warmer than normal temperatures for the entire state, which is what's expected for this time of year. And uh, for precipitation, we have some chances of precipitation for the northern central Sierras and it going either way for most of the state. Uh, this concludes our portion of the brief and we're available for any questions board members may have. Oh, that's great. Any additional questions? Actually, I like, I like the chair's um, suggestion that we include the Colorado River system as well. And um, I believe there was a, an increase in allocations for the CVP uh, recently, so it might be helpful to sometimes hear uh, what changes in allocations are happening as we see the water year evolve. But great job. Thanks, you guys. Thank you very much. All right. Item number six, monthly update on urban water conservation. Good morning, Chair Marcus, Good members morning, of the Mr. board. Yelena Hartman, senior scientist in your Office of Research Planning and Performance. Um, bringing you the summary of urban water production reports. Um, we are coming close to almost four full years of data, which we started to collect under the emergency uh, drought water conservation regulation, which expired in November of last year. Uh, but we have these reports going from June 2014 through uh, March 2018, so 46 months, and um, as you can see a reminder what the view through the window looked like in March. Uh, March was essentially uh, marvelous in terms of precipitation and filling up and topping off our reservoirs. Um, we bring back this slide uh, that shows um, last few years, so it's not notable years. It, we're really just looking at the last uh, oh, few years, which were years thank since you. the drought. Just kind of like as a nod to the conversation we had at the last board meeting where we looked at February precipitation. So um, the dark blue line in bold shows the 2018 March uh, precipitation and we went up 
uh, multiple inches. And um, the red line um, shows 2013. So 2013 was our baseline year for comparing uh, urban water production to 2013 monthly water production for comparison in terms of water conservation. And then we see in the last two marches, previous 2016 and 17, so the top two lines, showed that we had wet March those last two years, and this March was quite wet as well. So I think this will provide a bit of a context for us as we see the results. But the results, not surprisingly, given how wet it was, and it was a cool month, um, show that water conservation um, is up. So when we are comparing urban water production in March 2018 to the two thir 2013 baseline, we have almost two-thirds of or all urban suppliers that reported saving more than 20 percent. So the two darkest pieces of this chart show suppliers that saved more than 20 percent. Hmm. Uh, now if we start at one o'clock down, uh, we do see that uh, 43 suppliers elected not to report. So our reporting is slightly down compared to previous few months. What was uh, the uh, previous month number? Just previous for month, um, I cannot recall the actual number of suppliers, but we were in mid 90s last couple of months. Um, and we are now at 89% participation in terms of suppliers. The suppliers that didn't report are smaller suppliers because these 89% of suppliers that did submit reports represent more than 94% of the population served. So we know that these are smaller suppliers. And in fact, the way the board calendar falls and how we download the data, we essentially downloaded the data about a week earlier than we would have normally. So we pulled the data on the 20th. Well, in previous months, we downloaded data closer to the end of the month, like 26th or 7th. And so we, we do have additional seven reporters that uh, submitted um, results for March 2018 since we downloaded the data. So this is what today's report includes, just the ones that made it by the cutoff because we also have to review the data and analyze. That's helpful, just because you know, you know we we um, we really do uh, depend upon this information, and it's incredible that we've been able to gather this over the last four years. And so, yeah, it, but that's helpful that there's some nuances in the the number lowering, so it's appreciated. We just couldn't include these data, but each month when we release the data, we include all the reports we received. And in fact, for those following along online, we have released um, all the data concluding with March 2018, which are available on our website right now. In terms of these uh, great uh, savings, uh, we can look at what it means for the statewide water production. So uh, the orange line shows 2018. So the tip of that line is March 2018 water production at 103 billion gallons. Note that these are tentative volumes because we are missing reports for 11% of suppliers, but estimating what that would mean for that last orange spot, it mm -hmm. would bring it up about 10 million gallons or so, so billion. So it would be similar to last year's, uh, the dark gray line, March, which is still significantly below the, the baseline. So for the 89% of suppliers that reported in both periods, so March 2018 and 2013, we have savings of almost 25%. Again, we know weather affects the water use. It was a wet and cool month, so these data really underscore what we already know about the water use in California. To kind of sift out the influence of the missing reports, we've also started to uh, look at what it means in terms of per person daily use for uh, residential uh, urban users, and the black line shows the current month, so March 2018 statewide average was 65 gallons per person per day. Uh, the range that's shown in the orange box is for previous March results, so we don't include this month. The reason we didn't include this month is to show you that we've shifted that box downward. This is what we want to see. Of course, aided by weather, but we do want to see all these boxes shift down so we can push the bottom and we can also pull the ceiling down. And that's really kind of like what we are hoping to see. But this is clearly the lowest march uh, that we've had so far. 
In fact, it's the lowest uh, residential uh, use we've had this entire year because January really? and February were quite dry and unseasonably warm. So. so again, it's all for the people who aren't in the audience who haven't been with us every month. The point is that it's all about the lawn. So if it's, it's raining, people now know to turn their sprinklers off. So the fact that it was wet made it easier for folks to conserve. When it's dry, folks can't bear to not turn the sprinklers on, even though they don't really need to turn the sprinklers on. Precisely. And so we, we, we recognize the fact that it was a wet March, and people remembered and turned off their sprinklers. That's a good thing. And I think I was just reading recently as well. I mean, most people, I think, believe that most of their water use is indoors. and When, in fact, when it's, in fact outdoors. it's outdoors. Right. Yeah. Especially in the summer months. It's interesting. I can't, I'm trying to figure out, if, going back, so what? what's a, the percentage? Are you shying from just putting it on a slide for some reason? percent No. I, maybe we should have put a percent on there, but it's 24.8% compared to the baseline for the suppliers. So we're comparing what the suppliers that reported in March 2018, what did they report for 2013? So well, that's, that's almost much 25 percent better savings. than a fraction of a percent in February. Over the baseline. Yeah, over the baseline. Well, few put that number out. Okay, next. Time. Even though I'm not a total fan of percentages because it's just a construct, a comparative construct, and you have to talk about temperature, but I. I I wasn't totally sure reading the slides. Okay, cool. Well, and it balances out the for earlier in the year. So just a, a, if if you could provide a a running average for the year, that's we'll add that. That's, that's an that's interesting good. idea. Thank yeah. you. And I think it definitely highlights the the need for the long term efficiency picture here yeah. because that is it is bringing down that water use on the landscapes where you know, the majority of this water uses. We see that as we, right. we bounce back and forth. And when we have abnormally wet months, yeah. we have great conservation numbers. When it's dry and hot. It's and, a little harder. Yeah. yeah, I think the key for this year, the messaging is going to be, you know, we need to save water even if it's wet. And it's not wet. It's still a below normal year because we don't know how many years. I mean, that the lesson from the drought is that we can have many more years of dry weather than we've had in the past. And so you should save water all the time, frankly, because you never know. We have to, it's a harder message to do than when we were in the middle of the drought, so we need to think about that. That's true. Yeah. That's why we're trying to make conservation a California way of life, Thank wet you. or dry. Yes, exactly. Thanks. So as, as we already um, saw this uh, statewide uh, average for residential daily use per person was 65 gallons, which is less than it was last year. We set a record for a month of March. And uh, looking at the hydrologic regions, we are going from bottom up from 2013, the dark blue line, 2015, 16, 17, and then the orange line shows March 2018. Uh, the, the regional breakdown pretty much mirrors the statewide results in that the 2018 use was comparable in some areas even better than in the last couple of years. So uh, we don't see that orange bar getting really large unexpectedly in, in regions except Colorado River, which... Yeah, any insight as to what's happening there? Uh, as, you know, my, my hometown is from the region, so it's not the best numbers for me to be seeing. I don't want to speculate, but we know weather drives the use. So when we had wet March uh, statewide, um, there are definitely regions that didn't get that much precipitation. And we also know there's that microclimate ar around Kachuma that does not really fill that reservoir. Yeah. Um, so uh, Colorado River uh, is probably regional weather conditions. Uh, but I am speculating at this point. We can look into that and discuss uh, with suppliers, uh, more specific information. And really to wrap up, uh, to your uh, point, uh, Board Member Esquivel, uh, these data are important. We have almost four years. We are really working on this continued reporting. We are in the voluntary zone, but these uh, monthly reporting might become a requirement. We have some active uh, bills in the legislature. Um, we are also 
furthering our engagement with stakeholders to inform our water loss regulation. Uh, there was a workshop held in March, and the next one is on June 1st in Oakland. And then we'll follow with two more, uh, one in the Los Angeles area in August, and then uh, Sac Sacramento in November timeframe. And really to wrap up this month's report uh, would be a reminder that we are going into a warm period. Uh, so we need to be mindful of water use. Uh, there was a study released by a UC Davis group, a UC, UCLA, excuse me, UCLA group just recently talking about the whiplash in mm -hmm. California climate, uh, really, really dry, prolonged, and really, really wet. And really, our challenge is we know we're going to have dry and hot, whether on an annual basis during the summer season or Broadly, it could be a drought. We don't know when it's going to be and how long it's going to take. So we need to really mind our water use and we need to figure out how to counter that increase in demand that's driven by conditions, by our sustained conservation practices and just uh, embracing this, this way of living that should be for California. Always thinking about wisely using water. Great. Well stated, Ms. Hartman, and it was great to see you honored uh, last board meeting for your excellent service to the water boards and the people of the state of California. Um, I think to your point also, uh, the, the graph uh, that we saw in the last presentation about snowpack plus reservoirs. Yes, the reservoirs are full, the snowpack is not full. And um, so we're not going in to, with, with the rosiest of pictures from a supply standpoint in this state. And so conservation as we get into the warmer periods is, is absolutely imperative in our state because of the point, not just for this year, but for a potential five, six year um, period of dryness that we could face if the winters aren't as productive as this year. And remember how we felt at February, we weren't sure if we were gonna get a critical year this year, uh, but we had a, an exceptional March precipitation. So we could be in that position again within months Therefore, conservation this summer is imperative. So thank you for your excellent presentation. That's great. Can, can I um, trouble you to maybe work with Miriam and do uh, have, sort of tweet out some of the numbers? So you have the 4% from last year, the 24, whatever. Don't overstate it, but I think it would be important for the folks who were like watching it like a hawk in January and February, and it should include the issue it was a wet year, so we're not overstating it, but it'd be, it'd be nice to get that out. Is, um, on that number, you've, you've qualified it. I just yeah, want to be, I want to be clear uh, that the under reporting is not affecting the calculation of that number. Um, and if, if there's a way to normalize it, you know, to subtract out the unreporting suppliers. So we have a, a, a truer index of uh, percent say relative to March, 2013. That is, the, that, that is what we do. So to, to get the percent, we are only calculating 89% of suppliers that reported in both periods, and we compared that water use. Um, so we, we are definitely not wanting to make those savings look larger because in 2013, everybody reported, and in 2018, yeah. not everybody reported. So we are accounting for that uh, each month. Thank you. Thanks again a lot. All right. Item number seven. Ms. Hovick, do you want to introduce this one as folks come forward for item number seven? Or just let them do it? Oh, great. Maybe Damon will. Damon will. Um, sure. While we're setting up, um, I've got to get my right glasses on. I'm not used to my new bifocals yet. <laughs> um, in, in 2016, um, the State Water Board's Drought Response Outreach Program for Schools, DROPS, uh, provided grant funding to the um, um, Encinitas Union School District uh, to install stormwater best management practices um, throughout five elementary schools. And consistent with the intent of DROPS, students who have contributed significantly to BMP implementation through their participation in the Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan internship. Um, um, so uh, we're honored to have um, a panel here to report. 
And presenting this item, this item is um, Damon Badgel, um, who will introduce the other staff. Thank you. Thank We're you. looking forward to this item. Thank you all for joining us. Mr. Badgel. Good morning, uh, board members, Chair Marcus. My name is Damon Badgel. I'm the Stormwater Grant Program Manager in the Division of Financial Assistance. Accompanying me today, um, as you can see, there's several folks here. Um, we have Matt Wilson, who's the staff counsel uh, for the Stormwater Program. And to his left is Rashid Ait Basri, who's the grant manager for this project. And then you have the students of uh, Encinita Union School District, who are our main presenters for today. Um, I wanted to just provide, you know, I want to provide as much time as possible for our presenters, so I'll be very brief in my introduction. Um, to the Encinitas Union School District Stormwater Education Through Lifelong Learning Project. In August of 2016, the school district received $595,000 under the Drought Response Outreach Program for Schools, or better known as DROPS, to install stormwater management systems at five local elementary schools to capture, treat, and infiltrate stormwater runoff. The project is currently underway and the construction elements primarily include bioretention basins, bioswales, rainwater tanks, and pervious pavers. In addition, the DROPS program guidelines required all projects include an education and outreach component uh, to increase student and public understanding of the project's purpose and benefits. What makes this project unique is how extensively involved the district students have been um, in the implementation of the DROPS project through an existing internship program. The informational item today will cover the specifics of the internship program and the work being completed uh, by the students on the project. With that, I'll turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sophia Gonzalez. I am a sixth grade SWIP intern at Ocean Knoll Elementary School. Thank you for inviting us to speak this morning. In this presentation, you will be hearing from seven SWIP interns. We are all fifth and sixth grade students who go to school in the Encinitas Union School District. All nine schools are currently writing stormwater pollution prevention plans for our school sites. Our presentation will show you how SWIP internship program has given us the knowledge, expertise, and confidence to make real world improvements at our school. We have improved the water quality that is discharged off our school sites and we have the data to prove it. We also want to tell you about how we have used our DROPS grant. This unique opportunity has been a valuable part of the SWIP internship program. With DROPS, we have been able to build large scale BMPs at five of our schools. Lastly, we want to share with you our belief that students can be a valuable part of the solution. Our SWIP internship education is not just about preparing us for the future, our future is now. Each of us is actively engaged in achieving results that reduce pollutants from flowing off our school sites. Through outreach efforts of, of the over 300 SWIP interns at 11 schools, we have begun to change behaviors in our school communities and beyond. Hello, my name is Anna Venemeyer and I am a sixth grade SWIP intern at La Costa Heights. The SWIP interns at our school schools are environmental leaders who are raising awareness for the serious issue of pollution in our local waterways. We are teaching other students and the school staff as well as our community about behavior changes that need to be made and what each individual can do to improve water quality. Over the last four years, students in the SWIP internship program have already achieved impressive improvements we have reduced total suspended solids from f flowing into catch basins, reduced little litter on school sites, increased awareness of stormwater pollution flowing off our school campuses, created BMPs that reduced food waste in lunch areas from flowing into storm drains, and improved stormwater quality in parking lot areas. SWIP internship has delivered our message beyond the school, our school and local community. We have presented to industry associations, educational organizations, water boards, and most recently, the San Diego Regional Water Board Quality Control Board. 
As you develop the regulations for the new MS4 permits, please consider the following. New regulations should, should require students to empower and educate students to achieve improvements in water quality on their school campuses. Our presentation today will show you how students can create effective education and outreach campaigns, participate in school good housekeeping activities, and take meaningful and quantifiable actions to meet the, tra the state's trash amendments. Hi, my name is Ellie Larson, and I am a fifth grade SWIP intern at Oceanal. So how did this all come about? In 2013, Mr. Dean presented the idea for the SWIP internship program to Jerry Devitt, the Encinitas School District Facilities and Maintenance Director. He liked the idea of having interns help his custodial staff improve water quality. The SWIP internship program is run like a business. We are hired to work all year as interns to complete our product, a stormwater prevention pollution plan for our school campus. Yes, that's right, we interns do all the work. And what you will find amazing is that after doing all this work, collecting water samples in the pouring rain and writing a 60 page SWIP, we get paid zero. We are unpaid interterns. <laughs> so there's an unfunded mandate discussion somewhere in there. <laughs> The SWIP internship program has four parts, research and education, data collection and analysis, BMP design and implementation, and plan completion and presentation. In our weekly staff meetings, we discuss how the school discharges pollutants through stormwater runoff. We take field trips to view our local watersheds and visit water testing facilities. We study the blueprints of the school site stormwater system and follow the drain pipes that carry rainwater off campus and see where it ties into the city, infra into the city infrastructure. Once we understand all the basics, we begin collecting data and evaluating results. We conduct monthly visual observations at five drains on campus and document signs of pollution. But the most exciting activity is collecting rainwater samples during a rain event. When it rains for one hour, we put on our PPE and go out into the pouring rain to collect samples at our assigned drain. These samples are sent to a local lab for testing. Hi, I'm Robbie Hacker, a fifth grade SWIP intern at El Camino Creek. By reviewing the data we collected through our visual observations and our laboratory test results, we conclude that yes, our school campuses were contributing to the pollution in our ocean. So then we turn our efforts to creating solutions to reduce pollutants from our campus. We create three types of best management practices, BMPs. Non-structural or educational BMPs, easy to install and inexpensive BMPs, and elaborate and potentially expensive BMPs. During the last three years, we have not only written BMPs into our plans, but we have also implemented solutions. At El Camino Creek, we have constructed a drops project with a bios whale and rain barrels in our central quad, made posters and conducted a stormwater education fair, cleaned catch basins and added screens to capture pollutants and much more. At the end of the year, each of the nine EOSD schools present their completed SWIP reports to the school board. Each school presents their findings and recommendations with a multimedia presentation. Hi, I'm Alex Vinemeyer, and I'm a sixth grade SWIP intern at La Costa Heights. I'm going to tell you about one of the large scale BMPs, we, one of the six large scale BMPs we've completed with the help of the DROPS grant at our USD schools. In 2016, the SWIP interns at La Costa Heights identified the need to build a bioswale to filter high levels of fertilizer and TSS draining off the field on our campus. Our school district had no funds to pay for it. Mr. Dean applied for a grant offered by the California Water Board called the Drought Response Outreach Program for Schools. The people at DROPS must have really liked our program because our school district has a budget of $712,000 for six water quality, water quality projects. We began DROPS by, go, by going to extra meetings once a month to learn about and plan the project. 
We met with the civil engineer to discuss the objectives of the project, review the preliminary design plans, and make sure our design met the scope of work. Next, we met with a landscape architect to select plants best suited for the bioswale. Our survey crew came out to our weekly meeting and showed us how they determined how water flows in the parking lot. We got to use some of the equipment and see how elevations are determined and review the topographic maps of the area. Next, the civil engineer went to work and created the set of plans we needed in order for USD to collect bids on the project's construction costs. Then, contractors were invited to, to bid on our project. Who would have guessed how many documents are necessary in order for a project to go out to bid? Lots. The final bids from the contractors were brought to our SWIP meeting, and we opened the bids and awarded the contract to the lowest bidder. Last month, we hosted a groundbreaking at the project site. We invented VIPs from the community and the media. As you can see, the groundbreaking event was conduct conducted entirely by SWIP interns. We even used folding shovels to, to mark the start of construction, although that ground was pretty tough to break with those fancy shovels. <laughs> I bet. During our spring break, the drops funded by Oswell was completed near the field drain at La Costa Heights Elementary School. Several interns visited the site during construction and saw firsthand how the project plans on paper are trans transformed into the physical world. One of the key requirements of the DROPS grant is education. We have been busy educating our school and local community. To help this, we put up a poster at our school site explaining what our DROPS project is and why it is important. Next, we will be installing a permanent sign at the site to help educate visitors about how the bioswell works to filter pollutants out of the runoff and what they can do at home to keep our waterways clean. This is actually the second project completed at La Costa Heights using the DROPS grant. Last year, the intern supervised the construction of a bioswell in our parking lot landscaping island. Together, these two drops funded projects are designed to filter runoff from 47,000 square feet of drainage area on our school site. We now have a real world education tool to demonstrate how we as a community must take greater responsibility for stormwater runoff. Hi, my name is Delaney Martin and I am a sixth grade intern at Olivenhine Pioneer Elementary. I am going to tell you a little about the large scale BMP we designed at my school that was built with funds from the DROPS grant re we received. When the SWIP interns at OPE took samples at their parking lot drain and analyzed the results, they found excessive TSS and observed litter flowing into the drain. We needed a BMP to reduce these pollutants. Just like the other schools in our district that received DROPS grant funding, we met with a survey team, a civil engineer, and a landscape architect and participated in the contractor walkthrough and bid selection process. In the end, we designed a bioretention area for runoff from our parking lot with 780 square feet of pervious asphalt paving. Our project was started and completed over spring break last month. During construction, several interns went to the project site, met with the supervisor, and made sure everything was in order. The SWIP interns at my school conducted a ribbon cutting event two weeks ago. We gave an overview of the project and with oversized scissors, we cut the ribbon to demonstrate the completion of this construction project. Our ribbon cutting event was held in the rain. And as a result, we got to watch all the rain water from the parking lot disappear into the new pervious paving. No water even reached the drain inlet. Now we will also be monitoring the site and using it as an education tool for our students, parents, and community. Along with the project, Alex and Madeline described at La Costa Heights and the project I described at OPE, we have now completed six drops funded projects at USD schools. When you come to San Diego, please let us know. We'd love to give you a tour of our pro drops projects. Hi again, I have been asked to conclude this presentation. 
As you have heard today, what sets this program apart is that we accomplish real world improvements at our school and in our community. SWIP interns are actively working with school custodians to clean and improve school site stormwater systems. Messages from the SWIP internship litter campaigns are spreading and are having a direct impact in our schools. We have learned that traditional education methods don't work. You can't give a one hour assembly and hand out some pencils and think that will achieve meaningful goals and change behavior. We have learned that sustained peer to peer messaging is needed. This month, SWIP interns will be making 10 presentations to various adult groups from city councils to school boards and other special districts. We want our voices heard by individuals and organizations that share our goals. As SWIP interns, we are the next generation of stormwater advocates. Whether or not we ultimately end up with a career in the industry, we will always be powerful advocates for making real changes in cleaning our local waterways. We hope to have demonstrated today that with education and knowledge, even fifth and sixth grade students can make a difference. The California Stormwater Quality Association is working with the SWIP internship program to create a new generation that is knowledgeable and interested in working towards improved water quality in our local waterways. We would like to thank the following organizations for their support. Olivenhine Municipal Water District, DUDEC, Lacadia Wastewater District, the City of Encinitas Clean Water Program, San Diego High School District, and the City of Carlsbad. We also want to acknowledge Leslie Loudon, who helped make our drops experience so valuable. Thank you for allowing us to speak today. We are proud to be working with you in helping to improve water quality in the state of California. We would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions, comments? I have chills, I'm so happy. <laughs> Incredible work, you guys. Uh, my one question would be, you know, whichever would like to, uh, whichever one you would like to respond, is what challenges did you feel were the, the, the hardest to sort of overcome in some of the work that you were doing? Um, my school wasn't featured, we didn't do the drops, but maybe it was hard to find money to get the program going. Yeah, funding is always a challenge we find here as well. Well, you guys did incredible work, so great job. Well, th this is great. Thank you. You've inspired us to know that we've got a lot to look forward to for people in California to understand the value of water. And, and, you, and you have two really happy engineers sitting right yeah. here. Because you said the word engineer and civil engineer so many times. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, exactly. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll help out. I'll, I'll just ask some questions and go down the panel. Um, this is a very, uh, I'm sure folks are watching this and are just amazed that your preparation was excellent. It was a very well um, orchestrated uh, panel and it's among the best that we've seen in 2018. Um, so, I'm uh, Ms. Morton. Morton. Um, do you think the school program that you worked on would work for other schools in California? And I think SWIP is a great program to have. Um, um, I think kids would love to sign up for it. It's very satisfying, the work we do, to know that we have helped the environment and our community in a big way. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be great to have across California. Thank you. And Ms. Martin, um, she mentioned that she saw the improvements in the environment. Did you see improvements in the environment based on the work, all that, you know, going out to bid for projects and building things? Did you notice a difference in the creeks or the beaches? Yeah, um, we also, there's H2O Trash Patrol where we live, and um, we got to pick up trash in a lagoon near us, and um, that made a big difference because like there's so much trash and we picked it all up, so now it's all clean. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Gonzalez, um, uh, you, did you have a chance to participate in the, in the sample collection, like going out during the rain or collecting uh, the data? And what was that like? 
Well, um, I was not there when they did a rain event, mm -hmm. but Ellie was, so Ellie could talk to you about that. Um, yeah, we did. I, we did one recently, and pretty much what we do, we get after it rains for one hour, we get pulled out of class for a little bit, and we go out to our assigned drains, and we have. Um, I'm trying to remember. We have some. We have. We put it in a bottle, and we we take we take water out of our drain, and then we test it and we report the information that we find out, like if there was any dirt or litter in our water. Did you have to wear special clothes? Yeah, we yeah. had ponchos and gloves and glasses goggles. Yeah, that's great. And I, I bet the water looked a little different during the rain time than it does when it's clear. Yeah. Good. Well, um, how about well, Miss Gonzalez? Give you another chance. Uh, <laughs> on uh, how how do you get credit at school for this work? Is it part of the science class or is it part of the math? Well, it's um, it's sort of like a different club that um, we all meet different days during lunch. So it's more of a club that you sign up for, and then. Um, you get to collect water samples and go on field trips, and you get to learn a lot about the um, about stormwater. Mm -hmm. And Ms. Vennemeyer, did you, besides uh, going out in the field and that sort of thing, did you do any reports, or did you work on putting together tables or graphs of the information? Um, we have not had a chance to test in the um, field yet because it has not rained, but uh -huh. in the parking lot, we have seen a big improvement in the storm water running off into the parking lot drain, and um, it's going straight through the um, bioswale, and most of the water is soaking into the ground. Great. Uh, Mr. Hacker, uh, did you meet any interesting people uh, during learning about the storm water? Um, is there anybody uh, you remember, somebody who built stuff, or, or maybe a city council member, a mayor, anybody come to mind? Uh, I don't really remember, but I'm a fifth grade intern, uh -huh. so I've only been SWIT for one year, so maybe one of the senior interns or sixth grade interns might know if there were any special people who came. Uh -huh. Well, you did a great job on your report. Well, then, and Mr. Venemeyer, um, are you interested in uh, maybe working on water-related things when you, when you get older as a result of this work? Uh, probably, yeah, because the SWIP internship has empowered students to learn about things that probably you learn about way later in life or just never. So, yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thanks for all your thoughtful answers to my questions and for your interest in this program and just showing such a great example for not only kids your age, but for all the adults in the state. Thank you. Thank you. I will second the vice chair's comment that this is one of the best presentations we've had so far. You were concise, you were effective, and you were extremely, extremely uh, uh, thorough in presenting your analysis and your, your campaign. So I appreciate it very much. I do have a question. If we could go to slide 40 in your presentation. I love all the signs, but I am curious about the Mountain Dew sign. <laughs> <laughs> Could one of you explain why that Mountain Dew sign was out there? Were they a sponsor of the event? Did someone particularly like Mountain Dew? Um, it showed up a lot in the litter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not completely sure, but the girl that made the sign... Um, the beautiful she, sign. Yes, it is. She's, what, she's me and Sophia's friend. I'm not completely sure why. It might be because the cans are recyclable and she oh. might be, she might have drawn it because um, just a reminder that they're recyclable. Well, please let her know the sign is very nicely. Made. I will tell her. <laughs> and it, it causes people to think and ask why that sign is there. So she did a good job. It, it is a version of water, you know, Mountain Dew. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Potential sponsor. Part of the water cycle. 
Well, I too want to thank you. I learned um, a lot in looking at this and hearing from you. And um, I'm just a little jealous that we didn't have a program like this when I was growing up. So um, uh, just my only question to you is, is this a really cool club to be in? Uh, do your friends want to uh, join now? Um, or is it just like any other club on campus? I think um, there are a lot of people who want to do it from the start of the year just by hearing about it. And then later in the year, there are some people who might want to join. But um, sometimes there's not, sometimes there is. It's always different. And could you see this going on um, after you leave your school? Could you see this being something that um, future uh, classes would want to participate in? Yes, I could definitely see uh, newer students after we leave wanting to join this program. Great. And then I just want to thank uh, Ms. Venemeyer for your slide. I think it was your slide where you then uh, turned it back on us that as we move forward with the adoption of stormwater programs that we consider programs like this and your suggestions. So thanks for uh, doing all that you did at your schools, but also asking us to consider what you've done when we um, adopt policies uh, for the whole state of California. Thanks for coming. Thank you. That, I was thinking the same thing. It's inspiring to see what it is that you all have done and trying to figure, now that it's on us to figure out how to enable uh, more places to do it. But I want to thank you for the leadership you've shown, for taking the time to come here, and then all the adults who, who uh, helped you along the way, although you all don't seem like you need much help with anything. So I'm sure they thank you for all of, uh, of the help. But I do, I have a question just, I just, it's sort of the flip side of board member Esquivel's question about the challenges. What was the most fun thing about it? I want to go down the row. Start with you, Ms. Morton. The most fun thing about SWIP, I think, is when we get to share um, what we do with other people. So our school, a group of us, um, went around to the third grade classrooms um, a couple months ago and shared with the third graders about what we do and sort of um, telling them about SWIP and its effects on our environment and also slightly and a little bit of convincing them to join when they're old enough to. I enjoy that a lot. That's great. Mark? So what I like about SWIP is collecting the rain when it's raining and then like labeling the bottles and sending them off to get tested. Perfect. My favorite part. Right, is I know this is what people are thinking about for the labs. There's a future lab director. <laughs> My favorite part about SWIP is probably getting to come to different places and uh, public speaking and things like that. Excellent. Like Madeline, I like to um, educate other students and um, our school staff about what we do and how they can help the environment and, yeah. I agree with Sophia and Anna about the presenting public, public presentations and presenting to our school. Um, I also enjoy, Sophia and I in our, um, in our group at school, we are the, we create like an iMovie for um, presentations and when we worked on it, I thought that was fun in putting together all the photos and videos we've taken into one big project. Uh, my favorite part of SWIP is in-class testing. So sending uh, the stormwater samples to a lab and having them tested is very expensive. So if it rains a second time and we sample it, sometimes we get the test uh, for the pollutants in class. Mine's probably looking at the data after we, we get the uh, map <laughs> and then figuring out what. I, I got a couple lawyers here, so I just want. <laughs> and then what we can do to fix the problems that we're having at our campus. <laughs> Make sure he gets extra credit. You know, that the an I analytics. I feel like sending you Cal literature next. I'm just telling you. Well, thank you all. I mean, this was inspiring and uh, fantastic. And most importantly, thanks for the, the
the great work. I can't tell you how often people look at um, this work as if it's uh, just an obligation, but in fact, it's an opportunity to improve our communities. And it gets even better when folks like you get engaged. It's just, uh, I, I'm sure you've already inspired hundreds, if not thousands, and we'll, we'll think of other venues for you to do, especially since you like presenting so much. So I'm put on my thinking cap. This is fantastic, thank you. We should do a picture. Yeah, we should do a picture for sure. So someone needs to take your camera so you can be in the picture. Yeah. 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 We'll take this. It's time for we'll take a five minute break. And we'll come downstairs so that you're there's a, it's easier to. Make sure you got plenty of pictures here.
All right, it is 10.38 and everybody seems ready and wrapped with attention. So let's resume um, and move on to item number eight. Hi, John. Hi, Chair Marcus, board members. So that last presentation set the bar impossibly high, <laughs> which is why I'm very pleased today that David and Glenn will be doing the presentation. They did most of the heavy lifting on this item, so they're going to present it to you. And then Sarah did quite a bit of work in the in, as well. You want to raise your hand, Sarah? <laughs> so with that, we'll just get into it. Great. Good morning, board chair, fellow board members. My name is David Ciaccarelli from the Division of Administrative Services. I'm also here with Glenn Osterhage uh, within the division. And I'm here to give you an update on the Agricultural Lands Regulatory Program fee program. Um, and just to start, um, the, our fees were last updated um, on September 19th. Excuse me. Our fee schedule adoption um, and fees for the Ag program were last adopted on September 19, 2017. And at this board meeting, um, the fees were increased by 16%. And this was a, as a result of a approved BCP in the Budget Act that added an additional five PYs to the program. The program actually, and it's important to note that the program actually needed a 22% fee increase. However, the board um, made a decision to defer 6% of the cost and use the fund reserve to offset those costs. But during the meeting, there were um, several stakeholder comments in opposition of the existing fee methodology, which is currently the per acre fee. Therefore, the board directed staff to form a work group to discuss fee methodology alternatives. Which then the division administrative staff solicited feedback from state and regional board program staff. In preparation of the work group, division administrative staff worked with program staff to discuss the ag program as a whole. We were updated on current reg measures. Um, we were looking at the status of regional board orders. Uh, we identified key staff that should be involved in the work group. We also identified data and reports that would be provided to the stakeholders and would be helpful in making decisions on alternative fee structures. And there was a, um, an internal list that had uh, a list of alternative fee setting methodologies that the regional board and state board staff had been working on for several years. And that was gonna be key in the process as we moved forward in these meetings. And I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit here um, uh, in, in a couple of slides here. We then uh, set up and we, we met with stakeholders. It was via teleconference and, and, and the meeting was to organize the work group and lay the groundworks. Uh, the meeting was well represented uh, by the ag community. Uh, invites were sent out to over 40 stakeholders. And you know, in no particular order, and I may be missing a few, but we had stakeholder representation from various irrigation districts, water quality coalitions, farm bureaus, uh, food processors, the California Rice Commission, along with program staff in the state and regional water quality control boards. We also discussed the, the groundworks of the meeting and, and, and the general purpose of the meeting was to discuss our current fee schedules, um, discuss alternate uh, fee setting processes, address any issues, clarify any questions, and as, as, a, as a work group, come to some, to some type of consensus where we would be able to present potentially several options to the board at a scheduled workshop and receive further direction from the board. We also, you know, and, you, and I know you've heard these before, we talked about key principles in setting fee schedules. We needed a fee schedule that was equitable, uh, sustainable, um, easy to understand in the regulatory uh, community, uh, able to implement and administer. And, and this also goes with, you know, not adding additional costs to the program when we wanted to administer something, implement something. And then finally, you know, key in the process, and, and you know, you've heard this before, in the program, it's a zero-sum game. And so we talked about if we were building incentives or discounts or, or lowering the fees on, on a group of uh, ag fee payers, that another group on the other side would have to be increased. So again, a zero-sum game. So, so we, we went through and we definitely kind of laid out all those 
key principles. Finally, you know, we talked about the, you know, data and administrative support was going to be provided by the Division of Water Quality and Division of Administrative Services staff. Um, we provided historic program data on revenue expenditures, uh, PY allocations, uh, enrollment numbers, and again, the, the spreadsheet that listed various alternative fee setting methodologies with pros and cons. And I'll just, let me, let me just scroll over to that, uh, some of these bullets here. Um, these, were, these were some of the pre previously proposed by staff and stakeholders. So again, we had this ongoing list and we were you know, continually evaluating it and we put it together into a, a spreadsheet form. Um, again, with the, with the regional board and state board staff providing feedback and providing comments and, and pros and cons on it. Um, again, the, the current fee schedule is based on a per acre. There was a, uh, so, some of the, again, uh, the options were a per acre with minimum and maximum amount by grower, a tiered fee uh, by total coalition acres, um, a fee based on threat to water quality and complexity, uh, a regional board specific base coalition, individual grower or a combination, a waste discharge requirement coalition specific, and a commodity based on impact. Yeah, on that, on that point about impact, I see some overlap with threat to water quality, and yet impact could also be to staff resources, and just, you know, so when, when you say impact, what, what were you thinking? Um, well, de definitely, um, when we looked at the commodity specifically based on impact, like revenue for one, the, the financial basis of, of maybe one crop uh, is generating more revenue than others, um, the cost of compliance for that commodity, and again, also resources itself, um, how many resources it take on, on the commodity itself. So we... We moved into our first meeting, which was held on December 4th, 2017. And again, at this meeting, we started off, we discussed key principles and parameters of the meeting. Um, it was basically an informational exchange and you know, there was program history discussed. Um, and, and again, the, the meeting was driven by the list of alternatives that we had um, existing. Where and, was the meeting uh, held in? How, uh, how this, many uh, I, so all of these meetings were actually uh, teleconferenced. Okay. Um, and participation was? And, and exactly, we had we had good full participation in in these meetings. Roughly, how many? Um, well, we we actually didn't take a roll call, but we we sent the invites out to over forty again stakeholders, um, and um, the, again, the, you know, through the feedback on the phone and things like that, we knew that there were there were a lot of participants on the phone taking place in the meetings, and and again, I I, I had mentioned some of those groups of in our our pre meeting that did participate in the in the meetings. Therefore, we were, we were moving into, you know, we requested stakeholders to look at the current alternatives that were laid out and we wanted to get some feedback. So that was, that was our approach moving into our second meeting, along with um, if they wanted to develop or, you know, design another fee alternative um, and discuss it at the next meeting that, that currently wasn't on the list. And, and, and something that as staff, we also, had them you know, look at look at alternatives and there might be a hybrid in between maybe two of them that could come up with that could um, be effective on the fee setting process. So we moved into the second meeting, which was February 1st, 2018. And again, at this point, um, our request to the stakeholders were, you know, we wanted feedback on, on, on the alternatives. We wanted, you know, feedback on our current fee schedule. Um, we we're looking at, um, you know, moving forward on additional um, um, alternatives that could be designed and that we can discuss. Um, and then at this, at this meeting on February 1st, 2018, we received very little feedback. Um, we received actually no other fee alternatives. Hmm. Um, there were a, a couple of verbal commitments and one written response to actually keep the existing fee schedule. And the, the written response was from Sarah Rutherford from the Provost, Provost and Pritchard Consulting Group, which um, represents the Kern River Watershed Coalition Authority, Tulare Basin Water Quality Coalition, and the Westside uh, Water Quality Coalition. Um, and basically at this point, I mean, since we didn't really receive any feedback and, you know, working with the group, 
we decided to cancel our staff workshop, which was on March 16th of 2018. Um, and again, our, our intent of this workshop was to demonstrate that staff along with the stakeholders were working together, moving towards a general consensus on a couple of fee methodology alternatives. As a work group, uh, we, you know, we wanted to identify and address any issues um, at the workshop meeting level and resolve any of these issues in advance of the board adoption meeting so there wouldn't be any surprises to the board. And a potential uh, outcome of the workshop was having agreed upon one or several alternatives and we would be receiving feedback from the board on next steps. And so again, it, it just listed, um, again, these were the existing um, alternatives that were in play at the time and again, we didn't get any feedback on them. We, we also, through the process, we also discussed um, alternative funding sources special funds, general funds, but, you know, we briefly discussed it. We, we discussed, you know, that it's a legislative process and that um, general fund is in a sustainable, reliable um, funding source, specifically on a year-to-year -year basis. Um, and we also, you know, we touched basis a little bit on discounts and surcharges. Um, again, because we didn't get into the work group, you know, and as part of the fee developing fee structure, you know, our intent was looking at incentives or potential fee discounts that could be provided in the ag program. However, again, since the workshop never happened, uh, you know, staff and, and the work group never got into the, the weeds of the analysis. There, I, I, I do want to note that there is a, um, a letter regarding regulatory authority and fees related to wetlands and the wildlife refuge um, projects that program that currently that program and legal staff are in the process of responding to. So again, the at this point, the majority of the support was for keeping the existing fee structure, the, the per acre fee. And based on the work group feedback, currently staff will propose no changes to the fee structure for fiscal year 2018-19. Now, outside of this, again, work group, I want to add that the, the California Rice Commission uh, had a proposal submitted separately, again, from the work group efforts. And I, I want to kind of go over some of these bullet points on the Rice Commission proposal. So this was submitted separately from the work group effort, um, specific to the Rice Commission waste charge requirement. The methodology is based on demonstrated historic low impact to surface and groundwater quality. It's a unique nature of the crop results in less time and resources expended by the regional board staff. And the, the, what this would do is it would reduce the Rice Commission's waste charge requirement fee by approximately 50 to 20 percent per acre. Um, again, but it, since it's a zero sum game, it would increase fees for all other ag land discharges by approximately one to two cents per acre. So as we're moving forward, uh, this first bullet, again, we're ongoing Ag Lands Program Fee evalua Evaluation. Staff continues to work with stakeholders. What I want to uh, highlight here is on this chart, this is basically kind of discusses kind of the, the, a little bit of the history of the Ag program over the last four years, um, and it's comparing it with other programs. And I've, I, I know I've mentioned this before in other board meetings, and, and um, I know program staff has talked about this, is that the, the ag program has not matured yet as a, as a program here in California. The program started in 2003. Um, with that said, we have about 65 to 70% of our enrolled acres enrolled into the program, um, which basically means that program requirements aren't implemented throughout the state. And comparing that with several other programs, so when you look at um, this top chart here, we're basically showing, and, and we're, very, we're, we're comparing, again, the number of acres in the Ag Lands program compared to programs like our Stormwater Industrial Program and our MPDS program compared to actual invoices that are being issued. You can see that um, for the Stormwater Industrial and the MPDS program, those programs have leveled off, and, and the, the stability of the programs have basically remained the same over the last four years, compared to, again, the Ag Lands program, which continues to grow. 
And we're, we've seen a, a growth rate of about 30%. Which then again, as you can see in the bottom there, when it comes to staffing, that our staff, you know, our staffing has ramped up and it has increased, and and we've increased again by about 29% since 13-14, um, where our other programs again have basically leveled off. So I, I just thought I wanted to highlight these charts just because of the fact that the, the the programs again, it's still growing. It's it's not in the mature program stage. Um, and as staff, as I look at developing fee schedules, it it's, makes it easier basically to, to develop a fee schedule when a program's fully matured and we know all the issues and we, we're at a point where we know where it's gonna take you know, the staffing levels, the program requirements, um, and again, the, um, the, the estimated changes of the workload continue to change here. So our Again, our next steps, uh, we have journal stakeholder process. We have um, upcoming journal fee stakeholder meetings on June 14th, um, which will discuss um, all of our budgeted numbers that are gonna come from the May revised budget. Um, and then we have our, our August 2nd meeting, which at that point, we're hoping that we have an approved, uh, approved um, budget in place. And we'll discuss, again, those budgeted numbers and um, how the, the, the fees are gonna shake out at that point. So that concludes the, uh, the presentation. And um, Glenn and I are here to help answer any questions uh, that you may have. All right, and are you looking for direction today on what to do with the Rice proposal? Or are we just doing it as an update and then we'll ponder it? Or what's your? Yeah, the intention really was to bring it to you before the September meeting, let you ponder it. Um, but it is our recommendation right now that based on the feedback we got and a number of other factors, it, for the for this year at least, we keep the fee the same in the in the um, agricultural lands program. So I have a question. The um, on the last meeting, first meeting, second meeting. So December and February was um, the Rice Commission proposal uh, discussed specifically at either meeting? Uh, no, it wasn't. It was basically uh, outside of the group and. Um, the Rice Commission asked us actually not to share the presentation at, you know, with the group itself, so it was submitted separately. Oh, okay, well it seems to me that that would um, be a good place to have some discussions you know, within that committee, and since the workshop was canceled, I guess we'll hear from uh, Mr. Johnson on any suggestions you know, for further dialogue, I'll, I guess I'll just wait. Yeah, the question would be whether to raise it at the upcoming, the upcoming fee meeting. things and mm -hmm. see what other people think. Right. Um, and along those lines, um, is there any general feedback from program staff on the Rice Commission proposal? Hello, I'm Scott Couch with the uh, Division of Water Quality, uh, Groundwater Protection. We uh, listened, we were in the meeting and heard the Rice Commission proposal. We don't have a recommendation as to whether or not that's better than the, the uh, status quo. So we would concur with the fee unit that at this point in time um, that the uh, fees should remain the same, the structure. Thank you. And any um, secondhand information from the regional board program staff? Uh, Similar? I, we haven't brought up that specific question with them. Um, most of the conversation with the regional boards is that we need more resources. Um, they're all, um, all of the regions are saying that they don't have enough uh, resources to deal with the current uh, workload of the ag program. Uh, all the way from uh, state board through the large Central Valley ones to all the others that have the much smaller programs. Um, so that that's generally the conversation I have with the regions is uh, about the number of resources that are allocated to them. But um, in terms of the fee, no, I don't have a um, something from the region. Well, why don't we hear from the, uh, we have a couple of, um, comments. One, of course, Tim Johnson from the California Rice Commission, always good to see you. And Bob Gore, also for a variety of clients, also good to see you. So look forward to your insight. 
And thank you for those pictures. Madam Chair, members of the board, Tim Johnson with the California Rights Commission. Uh, I've got some prepared comments that I'll make. I would like to address at the onset a few things I think might be confusing for the board relative to the process that mm -hmm. you asked staff to undertake. We, we appreciate that process. I think it yielded about the results that we would expect, right? Uh, if you hadn't uh, spent the time analyzing your program as had Rice, uh, you were very supportive of the current program. And in fact, what we saw through that stakeholder process, which we participated in every meeting, provided extensive comments to the proposals that staff, in fact, had outlined, okay? We did ask that our proposal be held uh, so that our uh, colleagues that are similarly regulated uh, didn't spend all of their effort uh, tearing apart our proposal. Well, in fact, we saw was no other proposals other than Rice were forthcoming, okay? So what we have in front of you today and the recommendation from the Rice industry will be that you direct staff, please, to continue to work with us on our proposal, evaluate it thoroughly, uh, and come back to you with a recommendation on the appropriate uh, mechanism by which Rice can be charged a fee relative to both our impact as well as the maturity of our program. And I'll outline that argument. So I don't want you to think we didn't participate. I don't want you to think we didn't have a very mature proposal. Quite frankly, Rice was the only one that really put the work in to do that. And that's fine. We were the proponents of this. And so we would have expect that to be the case. Um, I just would note, uh, and, and I think it, it bears to, to, to really emphasize at the beginning that in addition to thanking you all for exploring this, it really is a policy item, right, that you're gonna have to decide. Is Rice going to be different in this program and, and why would that be the case? Uh, as the staff had outlined, uh, our proposal is a WDR specific proposal. You remember that was in their slide. Uh, based on actual time spent, it covers all indirect costs that should be shouldered by all, also uh, provides for a three-year reevaluation period. I would remind the board that there are many examples of differential fee, right? So NPDS, storm water, feedlots, dairies, cannabis, and in fact, um, as the staff had stated, uh, really a change in the Rice WDR fee would only have a very minimal impact, right, on this, on the, on the others in this category. And we appreciate that, that acknowledgement by staff. We'd also note that uh, the board in its adoption of the revised East San Joaquin order acknowledges the significant differences of Rice. And we would say, therefore, the amount of regulatory time uh, needed to protect surface and groundwater. You know, finally, I would note, and I think this is important, uh, while the Ag WDRs may not be a mature program, Rice is, all right? We have 27 years of management of the Rice Pesticide Program and data on that surface water program, quite frankly, much more rigor rigorous than the WDR. We also have established uh, monitoring sites over 30 years working with your board as well as the regional board. We also uh, would note that USGS has groundwater monitoring data under Rice for over 20 years. It is truly a mature program. It's different, right, as we've explained to you a number of times. We remain committed to working with your staff to develop the best approach uh, that both recognizes the significant difference uh, in coalitions and the impact on water quality, and one that also can be reasonably implemented by your staff. If it's an individual WDR, I mean, what does all that look like? We're open to, to any discussion uh, in that regard. In the end, however, it is a, a policy decision. You need to weigh a little bit of extra work on behalf of your, your competent uh, staff uh, in the fee division and then equity within the regulated community, which we see in other differential fees. Uh, we appreciate your thoughtful consideration of this important matter, and we would ask that today you direct staff, uh, please to work with the Rice Commission to fully evaluate uh, its fee proposal as it applies to Rice. Uh, we understand and support the fact that the fee would remain the same for this next year and would look forward to working with your staff the next year, oh, right, oh, to come I up with uh, a difference uh, and a different approach that would be appropriate. Uh, relative to discussions with the regional board, I have had significant discussions with the regional board, as you would expect. I think they are cautious. I certainly understand the comments relative to the overall uh, level of staff that they have to apply to these programs. 
Uh, however, they were supportive and are very aware of the Rice proposal moving forward, both the new executive officer as well as the uh, associate executive officer who in fact provided the data off of which we built our proposal. So I'd be happy to answer any questions, uh, be happy to fill in any, any blanks that might exist in your mind. Question. As I recall, I met with you um, quite a number of months before. Yes. In the so, before times? Yes. <laughs> relating this proposal. And so this proposal is one that unless it's been dramatically changed since what we discussed many, many moons ago, I assume that staff have had this proposal and have a chance to look at it. So what do you mean by thoroughly evaluate the proposal? I'm distressed uh, that after significant dialogue with your staff, they did not have or weren't able to provide you a response to the evaluation of the Rice proposal. I'm not sure why that would be, uh, but as you point out, this basic proposal has been in front of this board and this staff for now some time. In fact, we did update our proposal, but only to be reflective of the PY cost as provided by your fee division uh, between uh, the draft uh, member that you saw, uh, as well as the, the draft that's in front of you today as part of this informational item, just to make sure we got the cost right. We were working off older cost data, both in you know how, how much a PY cost is assigned uh, to various programs. So having said that, that was really the, the update we have. We've had very good conversation with your staff. I'm, you know, I was hopeful uh, that uh, you know, we would be able to come out with a strong staff recommendation. I understand why that may or may not be the case, but I, I would ask, right, that some clarity be provided by this board to your staff on what to do with this Rice proposal. Uh, we were the ones that have developed this approach. We have done, I think, significant work uh, in this respect. I think it is a valid uh, and fact-based, data-based proposal. Uh, we provide for flexibility relative to changes uh, in the amount of time of staff that we would use as well as updated common costs. You just need to figure out what you're going to do with the Rice proposal given that the stakeholder process quite frankly didn't yield the result, right, because others did not you know, spend as much time as we had in, in really codifying their thoughts I'm putting it down in a, in a way that staff could evaluate. In fact, nobody did, and that's fine. I, again, that's not a criticism, it's just an observation. So at the end of the day, you're left with rice. Uh, and this proposal, very different, but then again, we're a very different commodity, very mm -hmm. different you know, WDR uh, as it relates to these programs. And again, I would just also add that I, I understand this process is, is long, I'd hope that we could resolve it this year. Staff has been clear in our discussions. This might take some more time. They may have to keep the current fee as is until they can work through process with this board and with others. I would say we're, we're modest, we're, we're accepting of the time, uh, you know, as the, as the fee division and as the board needs to, to evaluate <laughs> this and put it into the appropriate context. As long as, right, we're working toward a, a reasonable solution for all parties. So this is a tough one um, because I uh, understand and appreciate uh, your perspective. And if I were you, I'd be standing there asking for the same thing. Um, if you look at the amount of time uh, that's spent on um, the staff PY time that's spent on uh, the evaluation of your program and keeping it going, the, um, the concern that I have, I had hoped that this process would have brought everyone out so that uh, the, the stakeholders and staff um, could uh, discuss not just your proposal but some parameters if they're is going to be a fee di differential, what should it be based on? And so I appreciate um, that you, uh, that staff did outline different approaches, but it just seems that since nothing officially was on the table, um, you didn't really get much of a response. And so the concern that I have is that if we say yes to this, um, or if there's a, well, actually before we'd say yes, if there was a, an actual proposal on the table, I think, I suspect 
that we would hear from other parties because of the zero sum game um, issue. At this point, it doesn't seem to be um, that big of a difference in terms of um, shifting um, uh, costs around, fees around, but um, through time, because the program hasn't fully matured, uh, I, I just think we would need um, some additional analysis, and I don't, um, uh, I don't object at all to spending more time on it. But I think that we've got to get, if we do spend more time on it, we need to have um, some way to structure the discussion so that we bring people out to talk about, you know, uh, would they be supportive, opposed, would they have their own? If you get a fee differential then what happens to other ideas that are out there, uh, coalitions or uh, low, other uh, low threat, uh, low vulnerability areas. Um, and so once, um, once those discussions are in play, I think that that would give us probably a better sense of how things could evolve, not just for Rice, but for others that are in this program. So if I, I might I, respond to that. Uh, in our initial uh, proposal to staff as part of the stakeholder process, we had one sentence in there where we asked that the rice proposal not be forward until such time as my colleagues in agriculture and the WDR forwarded similar proposals so that we could all uh, have an equal evaluation of proposals. None were forthcoming, okay? Not in my best interest or your staff's right, to have the rice proposal be the only thing, right, that was out there getting beat up. And, and that's what we expect to happen. So when the last stakeholder meeting was canceled, right, of course it, it left a void. So I don't disagree with you that certainly you as a board need some other input on this. I'm not gonna send you a news flash here but I would not expect that there are going to be an awful lot of people think they ought to pay a little bit more so that Rice can pay less. So we need some parameters on this discussion so that those that have performed for 27 years don't spend the next year, right, arguing with my colleagues about two cents. Right. I'm trying to think about what the vehicle would be because I... I, and I don't understand why next year and not in these two stakeholder meetings that are coming up. I, I always trying to be deferential to your staff that said this might take another year, Tim, get over it. And I said, I can understand I, that. I just don't totally get it because I have to admit, having done this 20 years ago, I'm all for regulating industry by industry. We just haven't had the time to do. Sure. Um, if we hadn't had a big drought and everything, I would have been pushing an initiative to do that because it's apples and oranges, and we think in terms of even the Dairy Quality Assurance Partnership, which I know some people weren't that keen on, but we evaluated that it took less of our time, and so I'm a supporter of it. So I think rewarding an industry that's already ahead of the curve, and we know it doesn't have an impact, and we already have the data for this small amount of money doesn't seem like that big of a deal to me. It seems like good public policy. So again, I'm being superficial. I know there are more data, and people need a chance to comment, but if there hasn't been the vehicle for the conversation, I, I definitely want to direct staff to continue the conversation. But I want to think about whether we can do it this year, because that's where we want to go, Thank at you. least where I want to go. Now, it may all be more complicated once people speak up, but it's not about, and I'll wait, Mr. Gore will have something to say, perhaps, but in theory, this is not, this is nothing uh, like the customization that I've seen at a much higher scale in much other in many other contexts it does take a little more work, but there's a choice that I don't mind making if the data supports it. So um, that's just where I am. But let, let's hear from Mr. Gore, unless there are more questions of Mr. Johnson. I'll, go, I'll you know, wait. Go ahead I'll, if you... I'll, I'll wait to hear from Mr. Gore. Actually, right. thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair and Board Members. Uh, Robert Gore from the Gualco Group, <coughs> excuse me, on behalf of the Modesto uh, Ir Irrigation District, Kings, uh, Kern County Water, and some peripheral uh, irrigation districts that will be impacted, United Water and Zone 7, also the California Association of Wine Grape Growers. Mm -hmm. um, to elaborate, and, and um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the staff. This has actually been three years underway, and they've been very uh, uh, conscientious, meticulous, and, and detailed. Yeah, and um, this is evolutionary. For example, 
there are 400 uh, different commodities, 200 different soil types. The commodities include row crops, permanent crops, livestock. The 200 different soil types overlie a hydrogeography that's as varied as from Chula Vista to Crescent City, having done hearings in both those places. Uh, it's, it's very, very uh, uh, complex and an evolving statewide program presents a, a matrix that uh, becomes a moving target. It may be best to wait till some stability is achieved. I don't know, we'll answer that in the next uh, cu couple weeks. The program staff might be involved as we proceed. It's sometimes difficult to have a full conversation with um, the, the, the rate setters uh, exclusively, um, but please do consider all of these complexities as we move ahead doing um, uh, commodity by, by commodity assessments ironically may in the end increase costs because sure. of the complexities of, of, the, of the calculations. Um, but it, it may be possible as well, don't know, but we'll all work together to, to achieve that. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think the idea of doing 400 commodities in different locations, definitely challenging the question is, the question is and the question that's presented is the rice sufficiently different to warrant a bit of a difference. I mean, that's all which is one that's more mature based on just experience, but also what Mr. Johnson said. Mr. Hodgeshop, you're gonna to have to give her a card afterwards, but please okay, go I'll ahead. i do that. I apologize, I brought that's neither, I, I filled out neither a card nor brought a PowerPoint, so I'm working, working uh, from uh, on the fly here. One, I wanna thank you. It was your direction last September uh, because of comments you heard from myself and from the Rice Commission about the, um, the um, methodology and the need to look at it. And I want to thank your staff because they did take it and, and begin to flush it out and we hadn't seen that previously. Um, last July we had a meeting that was specifically focused on irrigated agriculture and whether, uh, you know, I, I, I took a shot. Uh, and and I there, and I drew fire uh, because I put before the uh, other agricultural water quality coalitions what I thought was an equitable approach, and I continue to advocate that in the comment letter uh, that I provided you. Um, I think it's one that bears um, exploration even further. And there's two component parts. There's a you know there's the staffing aspect. There's the direct cost, and then there's the indirect cost and finding a way to equitably distribute that uh, given uh, surface water and groundwater quality conditions and results is what I'll be working with the other water quality coalitions to try to, uh, to move forward. Um, just, just some facts, and I've provided you facts before, mm -hmm. but we, uh, today's May 1st, and today is the day in which all agricultural water quality, well, most of the agricultural water quality coalitions file their annual monitoring report file their management plan progress reports and a number of reports to the regional board. Uh, last year, 2017, was a non-assessment year. We had one pesticide exceedance. It was for a pesticide that's commonly used in, in, uh, in um, uh, strips for uh, fly strips. But that was it. In the 1.3 million irrigated acres and the 20 surface water quality monitoring sites we have. Recently, we did an analysis of our toxicity results, and between 2012 and 2017, we did 700 toxicity tests, and we had 16 that were statistically exceedances. So my rough math is that's less than 1%. Uh, in our upper watersheds, as you've heard me uh, mention before, is predominantly irrigated pasture that doesn't apply nitrogen, doesn't have pesticides, so I will be working with the other water quality coalitions uh, once again um, to, uh, to see if we can't create a, an allocation methodology that's either regional in approach. So you take the three hydrologic regions of the, uh, of the Central Valley and you create a fee in that area or something that recognizes uh, you know, the, the uh, different tiering. So I do want to, but I did want to, because of your action last year, wanted to acknowledge that, thank you. And, Thanks, staff, for at least continuing to move that forward. Thank you. 
so additional I, thoughts? Yeah, just one more. Um, uh, just want to thank um, the commanders and in particular want to call out this Rice Commission letter of April 24th. And I'm looking at the chart that um, is included in here. There's a matrix and um, uh, I don't know if staff put that together or yes. Okay, so this is in the Rice Commission letter. There's a two page chart. Um, I mean, for me, again, I'm supportive in general, but I, I just feel that we need to have some framework to mm -hmm. better understand um, what should um, justify a fee differential and, um, you know, where that, where um, other uh, fee payers could also make similar arguments because I suspect that um, if we were to move forward on this, we're going to hear from others. And so um, I, I feel that this would be something that staff should be looking at and then making recommendations on in, in general, a framework, uh, whether it's something like this, but I'm not, I'm not seeing the RICE proposal in here. So these are more general categories. So if uh, you do uh, come back with something for RICE specific, what would that look like in, how would you categorize it? So it's not just rice, others could potentially come in. What would it be based on? What are the parameters? A couple quick questions and then just some general comment. Uh, first, when it comes to the other programs that have variances or differentials in the program, how were they developed? How did they kind of come to be? Um, if you don't have a complete answer now, but any quick insight. And then at what percentage are we uh, at enrollment on irrigated lands as sort of a, just a proxy for then what a fully engaged program might look like? Well, the, to answer your first question, um, a lot of it, a lot of it depends on, you know, the regional, uh, the regional base orders basically. So the coverage that's in the order itself, um, or is going to lay out kind of the requirements of, again, those commodities are in, in that, uh, in that basin. Um, and, and, and again, if uh, Scott wants to add anything or program wants to add anything on that. Um, regarding our, our our totals, basically, we've got about, I think it's 6.8 million acres enrolled. Um, and that's what we just build off of. And that building went out a couple months ago. Um, and you know, we estimate that there's about 9 million acres um, uh, statewide. With that said, there uh, region one and I believe region six have not officially adopted the orders are in place. And then there's a couple of regions that have just adopted, but they're again in the process of enrolling. Um, and it is, again, it's not just enrolling. And once the, once the uh, acres are enrolled, then there's that whole implementation of the program itself. Uh, so um, again, we're, and, and, you know, talking to program, it's, it's, when you look at regions like region three and region five that have had the orders in place since 2003, uh, and they're at you know ninety almost ninety five percent enrollment total, and it's it's those you know large farms they're, they're I guess more easier to get in, but it's it's those smaller farms that they're having to put the resources towards to try to draw them into the program. Um, but once we do get some of the other again, I believe it's region um, uh, the re, excuse me region one and region six with those acres that total almost five hundred thousand acres, so it's it would go towards a, a nice amount of revenue to help kind of offset um, the cost of this program. And so um, you sorry, had that but, first question though about other differential fees in different programs, is that right, Board Member Eskimo? Yeah. And, uh, and how how they come about, I'm, I'm thinking of the, and Chair Marcus mentioned the, D, the dairy, dairy Quality Assurance Program as an example. And that's just within dairy to dairy, right? Yeah, so within MPDS and the other programs. C correct. Um, so for example, like the stormwater program, we have it broken down by industrial, municipal, construction. So within within those orders, there's you know three different kind of realms of that of that, the permitting process. So we do assess fees um, based on again you know industrial uh, uh, a permit again for construction. Um, and w do we go as detailed as you know, size or you know how, how how further down I guess do we go in the granularity of that work already? Right. I mean, some of them are based on, you know, size of acres, the, the, the volume of, of people uh, that are involved in the actual permit, like the industrial permit. Um, I was just going to jump in on as far as differential and programs, probably the two biggest ones are WDR because it's threat and complexity. So that's a more of a 
um, subjective type. Well, there are parameters, so I don't want to say subjective that way, but there are limitations of what you're assigned to, so you could pay a higher fee or lower fee. Uh, NPDES does have, for the general permittees, does have three categories. Again, it could define which level you're in. Confined animals is the biggest one people are aware of because you can get a reduced fee uh, if you meet certain parameters of that program. So there are a few other ones that we do have differential fees. Stormwater, um, industrial is a flat fee. Construction is just based off of acres. Uh, municipal, you know, number of populations, those are fixed numbers. Uh, they don't change as much. Thank you. That's, that's helpful. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I guess my, my comment would just be that I agree with the chair that when we, we look at these programs, um, it's the direction we want to go. Uh, this, you know, the, to account for where the actual staff time is going to be more granular. The issue here, obviously, is that it is a program still in flux. I think that that, that, that point's clear. But there, there must be some way, and, and again, I think this is for staff to better determine that, you know, is the program at a po point where we can start incentivizing that way, given, um, again, it's, it's how we, it's, it's the most equitable way, uh, it's a more sort of data-driven way, if you will, but uh, there is this cost benefit on the uh, amount of staff time it takes to do that with the program, especially a program in, in mid-air, if you will, mid-flight, mm. still kind of being put together but I'm interested as well as kind of accelerating how, how, we, can, how we can figure that out. And, and again, the challenge being that this is just a rice proposal. We can't, you know, if we do this one off and, you know, the, the floodgates sort of open and everyone then starts coming through it again, it, it kind of, it, we can impact staff time and the sort of efficiency of being able to, to do this work. And there's a, a point where it becomes too much, but I think it's, from, from my own perspective as well, it is the direction we should be going with these programs. Um, and it is important to, to be able to accurately account for where the staff time is going and to incentivize then those that are doing more as opposed to taking up more staff time because they're not as sort of sophisticated or, or doing as good work, so. Yeah, I was gonna add in, as far as you know, um, staff time is what we're trying to set the fee for as representation and we're not a cost um, you not know, say cost of compliance, but uh, fee for service. So it's representation of the staff time. Uh, the other program right, I forgot yeah, to mention was water quality sure. certification. Uh, there is a reduced fee for re ecological restoration projects. So that was the other one I forgot to add in there. Hmm. Thank you. Good. Well, I'm going to take a little uh, different uh, viewpoint on this. Um, I, I appreciate wanting to reward good work out there and everything, but I, I think what bothers me about the Rice Commission proposal is I feel like I'm hearing something like a tertiary treatment plant saying we should get a lower fee because we do better water quality in our discharge than a secondary treatment plant. So I, I take a view that um, much like a water bill and this, mis, uh, or this uh, misperception among the payers of water bills, that the volume of water is what you're paying for. It's really the pipes and the pumps and the plants that you pay for. And it's a common misperception. I, I think among our regulated community, I think there's a little bit of a misperception about uh, just having you know, the staff uh, available to deal with issues as they come up, having the infrastructure that you're paying for. So while I applaud and, and will you know, go in public and really thank the rice farmers for their innovation and their performance, uh, I don't see um, a strong argument for a differential in fee because I think they have the infrastructure of staff responding and I think that um, rice can damage water quality, it has as much of a threat to water quality as any farming uh, enterprise if it's not well managed. Um, dissolved oxygen issues um, um, that can arise are, are significant and it requires oversight. So. I, I uh, take a contrarian view on this discussion. Interesting. We're not going to decide something today. Nothing's being decided, but I just I caution against the use of, of these um, you know fee for performance approaches because of just the need for oversight. Thanks. Yeah. I wonder if we might perhaps borrow a page from our water agencies during the entire conservation discussion. Hmm. Is there a way to set a two-tiered uh, fee system where there's a base tier that covers some operational baseline cost, staff cost that we have, and then 
an incentive tier on top of that that is based on impacts, threats, uh, good outcomes. I mean, obviously it's not something I'm expecting you to whip out today, but given that structure had worked well for some of the water agencies when they saw uh, conservation being improved, and some of them were already on the system where they can adjust accordingly and reward good conservation at the same time not threatening their their basic operational budget, perhaps that's an avenue we could explore as well. Off into the future, I think we could. I don't think we could do it in short no, because I, of no, the yeah. lack of maturity of the uh, process, but it's worth thinking about. I mean, I have to say, I only, I see, the only reason I see this a little differently, and again, that you'd have to lay it out for people to look at is I, I think the question for me would be, is RICE qualitatively different enough, 20 years ahead enough, have the data enough to be able to make a judgment? I'm not saying set fee for service or set it by 400 commodities, because we just don't have the staffing or the tools to do that now. Eventually, I think we will. But the question would be, can RICE make the case that they're sufficiently different that they're going to take actually take less time, and the cost differential is small. So as a one-off, or if there's some other commodity group that's that much, I wouldn't do it to the micron, because it's not worth our time. It's just like in any, if you had alternative compliance, it's not worth it if someone has an alternative way to do the same thing. But if, if someone's going to do a lot more than the standards, then I'm willing to spend some time thinking about how to reward them on red tape or fees or whatever. That, I think, is a model that's important to not shut the door on by multiplying by 400, because then you're a bureaucrat. And we are bureaucrats, proud bureaucrats, I get it. But we shouldn't just think in terms of we can't do it 400 ways, so we shouldn't do it at all. The question back is, where's the beef? Show me the difference. Show me that it's qualitatively different and that, so that everybody can see that it's qualitatively different. And that, I think, we always have to be open to. So uh, um, just a thought is that, um, that I think that, you know, all the work we've done in Ag has shown that there are differences. There's difference between rangeland and um, there's difference between rice and there's difference between um, irrigated crops and there's difference between um, orchards. And so all of that, um, I think is true, and I'm not supposing that we should close the door on all of it, but we should, if we're interested in this, be putting on to the, um, to the asking the regions or the yeah. coalitions to give us real data over our next few years on how much time they spend on different activities and different commodities. It may be that, the, um, that there's a substantial difference in certain um, coalitions and certain commodities, and it may be that that difference is very small. Right. I don't know the answer to that question, but um, as we move forward, I think it would behoove us to know where we're spending the most effort if we're going to try and um, fine tune these um, fees. No, I think that's fair, and that's why just assuming what the regions would say, of course they want more money, but it, the total isn't what's at play here is it, there should be a, a question asked of the regional boards that deal with rice about whether they think this makes sense. They obviously have agreed it makes sense in other contexts. And so having closed the door on it without even asking the question is what I'm reacting to. I mean, I, I realize you guys have a lot of work to do, but I don't think it's an unreasonable request to ask that question. You can ask that question this year and then come back to us individually or whatever and then figure out what the next steps are. You're not asking us to decide it today. We're keeping our minds open. And I'm expressing my discomfort with closing the door. Board member Moore has a very absolutely valid point. The question is, is there a difference and can we show it? And I don't mind rewarding something that stands out significantly and has been doing it a lot longer. And, and, I, would, and I would just say when it comes to the data um, and the need maybe to collect more, not to you know, try to put this off too much here and say, well, let's wait a few years and get a lot more data, but, you know, do an assessment of what we have now. And yeah. it seems that there is adequate enough that Rice has made this conclusion, <laughs> but 
we need to not just, you know, I think the, the point is, it's not just about rice here, it's about the program more holistically. And so what does the framework look like that we may approach in an acceptance of the rice proposal, but be able to still have that sideboard, have that information. Um, but I would just be a little, you know, concerned that we might put that off then for, you know, another three or four years as we continue to try to gain more data or something. And m maybe there's a way to have a decision sooner rather than later, if not. Yeah, we're certainly willing to do that. Fortunately, all of the rice acreage is in one region. We can go back to the region, work oh, with them to see what, um, that was our, our primary, um, primary uncomfortableness with this is that, you know, the, the impacts were just based on estimates. We didn't really have any hard data to support it. And the staff time too, that was all just an estimate. Uh, but I did want to correct a misperception. Okay. Um, Mr. Johnson, um, and I want to apologize, Mr. Johnson, if we gave the misperception that they weren't at the table, they weren't um, participating, they certainly were. They gave us a very well-developed proposal. Um, they were with us all along as we were doing this. And it, it really, the, the stakeholder group, sometimes it, it just works out that it doesn't, it doesn't go the way you think it would. Um, their proposal was on the table. We asked for other proposals. And like David said, we really didn't get anything. So we didn't unilaterally cancel the workshop that we were going to do. We, we talked to all the stakeholders and said, is there any point to having a workshop if there's going to be one point of view to that workshop? Because our, obviously we wanted a lot of people to come and say, I like A, and this is why I like A. I like B, this is why I like B. And then we could come to you and say, here's the various options. Mm -hmm. But really, it boiled down to um, there was one option and the Rice Commission option. So uh, that's what we came to you today is with the two options. So I, I certainly want to apologize to if we gave you the misperception that the Rice Commission hadn't been at the table with us. Um, and then, Mr. Johnson, we also agree with them. It really is a policy decision. Um, the, as, as one of the slides showed, the financial impact is relatively minor. The administrative impact is relatively minor. Um, but is it, a, is it a road that we want to go down? And we're certainly willing to work with the region. We can get some of that data for you, I think, fairly quickly Good. and come back to you with a little bit more, um, more fleshed out. And we'll work with the other coalitions as well. Like um, Bruce said, if, if he wants to put in a, a more detailed proposal, we're certainly okay with that. Well, I, I, I think that um, it, it's not just an issue of, as you say, it's a, it's a policy call, but a policy call on what? Uh, a policy call on rice or a policy pro call on a differential fee? And that's what I'm interested in seeing, a policy call on a differential fee based on what criteria. And I think that if you put that out on the table, um, maybe reschedule a workshop. I don't know uh, about the timing for this year, but um, uh, get get people to come out. Of course, the other ag groups were holding back because they're not going to support. It's a zero sum game. It's going to come out of their hide. But if you put something broader than rice on the table based on a criteria, that then um, they can the other stakeholders and the regions uh, could come out and comment on. That's what I'm interested in hearing. You know, how would this play out um, if we were to uh, have a criteria that we could apply uh, to rice, other commodities, or other low vulnerability areas? So I appreciate that. Um, again, you, we talk about the maturity of, of the program and the amount of time and experience that we have um, to, to back cast and, and then forecast. And I'm uncomfortable with that. You know, I think the ag program is evolving and the amount of time staff spend on certain areas or certain commodities is going to change year to year. So, but I, I want to step back a little bit and think of, you know, my decades of experience in WDR, for instance. And you mentioned the threat to water quality complexity, something I'm very comfortable with, see at work, uh, not controversial. Um, you know, and if there's any pushback, it gets resolved. So are we ready to look at that type of structure for the ag fee structure, the threat to water quality complexity? And if not, is it relate to the fact that we don't have enough experience at this point? Or is that a way to do this without calling out a specific commodity uh, and actually, you know, finding a path where people feel treated more equitably? I was going to add, we have some challenges in the ag program because some regions have coalitions. So we don't have the yeah. grower information specifically. Region 3 does have individual growers, so we have those individual permittees. So 
we have some, some complexities there. I also wanted to add in um, trying to separate the two conversations of the annual fee, which as you indicated was for the oversight of staff costs and cost of compliance, which is not part of the annual mm -hmm. fee, mm -hmm. and whether or not there's any ways of having savings for certain, in this case, commodities or um, coalitions um, because of the nature of their business, they can monitor less or whatever the uh, technical requirements are. Sorry, keep grabbing the microphone here, but um, coalitions, that's a very good point. The program has not yet matured, and you, my fellow board members know how strongly I feel about coalitions, because they don't have coalitions in Region 3. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out from a fee perspective. Um, uh, that program in Region 3 is, um, there's going to be a lot of work that staff at Region 3 is going to have to perform because they don't have coalitions. And so, uh, again, because the program is not yet mature, um, it's hard to see how this would play out. But if you look at it from an equity perspective, if you're in a coalition and you're paying $7.50 an acre plus our fee, um, I'm certain that we are going to hear at some point uh, from uh, certain coalitions, regions of the state, uh, as fees have to go up for the whole program because there might be you know, one region where it's a little more staff intensive, certainly we're going to get requests um, from others. And, and again, that's why I'd be looking for you know, some parameters on how to make these decisions. All right, well, that was all helpful. Guess we'll mull it over and talk with you about it. Thanks. Anything else? Just good conversation. Thanks, everyone. Thoughtful. Thanks, all. All right. I suggest a six minute break before item number nine.
All right, we are back. It is 1147. Speaking of things we've been looking forward to, take it away, Mr. George. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Chair Marcus, members of the board. Uh, I'm Michael George, Delta Watermaster. Pleased to be here today. Uh, uh, I know that uh, a study comparing ways to estimate consumptive use may not seem like the most exciting thing, but I've been spending probably three years on this, and I can tell you that it's really exciting. <laughs> and I hope that uh, this morning will give you a little insight, not only into what we've done, but I think much more importantly, how we can use this going forward. So with me today is uh, Dr. Jay Lund on my right, who, as you know, is a director of the Center for Watershed Science at UC Davis. And on my left, Jesse Jankowski, who's a graduate uh, research student uh, who's been uh, deeply involved. And uh, <clears throat> I warn you that if you ask questions, Jesse can take you way down into the weeds on this. We're going to try and keep it up. but. To the extent that you want to know, write what happens at the 30 by 30 pixel. Uh, Jesse can take you right down there. Okay. So to, to spare you that, um, give you an idea of what we're going to talk about, exactly how the study came to be, what the purpose of the study was, who sponsored it and participated in it. And then Jesse's going to talk a little bit about how the research was organized and what the primary findings were. But we really want to spend some time talking about the implications and applications of this study and what we think is uh, going to be next. And do so, you want us to wait till you're done to ask questions or to interrupt? You as can we have interrupt them? anytime you want. Do it either way. Yeah, so by all means, if a question occurs to you, go ahead and, and, and ask it. <clears throat> so to start with the challenge, uh, as we all recognize that as we were dealing with the real-time issues in the drought, we lacked good data on what happens to consumptive use within the Delta. It's a tough place to make good, accurate estimates and to do so in real time so that you can use them in the time that uh, the insights from that data can, can change the way you operate. It's particularly uh, complex in the Delta, not only because it's big, but because it's varied, it's different soils, different uh, wind conditions, different uh, uh, elevations of the uh, uh, crop lands. In addition, one of the things that we came to understand even better is how quickly and how dramatically land use changes in the Delta, even from year to year. We had a two-year study, 15 and 16, we were in the field. Mm. We were surprised, I think all of us, at how dramatically land use is changing and what's, uh, what, what the implications are. And it's also important to recognize that in all of our models, in all of our regulatory approaches and so forth, we basically treat the delta as a black box. We look at mass balance, how much comes in, how much goes out, mm -hmm. what are the water quality at certain points in it. But getting into that black box requires understanding better what happens to consumptive use of crops in the delta. So it's important, it's the most critical in shortage conditions, and it is when, uh, like in 2015, we wish we had more real-time accurate data. Partly for Delta Island consumptive use, which is one of the inputs from, for our project regulatory structure. We look at mass balance to understand water quality and volumes, but as we found out through the voluntary program to reduce diversions in the Delta, we didn't know enough about how that was working until months later. And yet the impact turned out to have been pretty specific uh, and, and, and pretty impactful on what was happening in the Delta at the time. We use these uh, data to manage project exports, again, because we look at it as a mass balance uh, and and Limiting or increasing exports was one of the few tools that we had to deal with. We need to use it for water rights administration and for planning, not only for what we're going to do in agriculture, but the next frontier is what we're going to do in terms of restoration. So it's important. <clears throat> 
As a result of that, and I want to thank uh, Board Member Dodek and former Board Member Spivey Weber, they were the inspirations, and particularly uh, Tam coming to our very first meeting in February of 2016 out at UC Davis, bringing a lot of disparate people together to kind of say, what do we, what, why is this important? How should we participate? What's it going to come to? And uh, Board Member Dodex actually coming to that uh, indicated to all the board, all the members, all the people who came, that this was an important thing and that we were going to take a look at it at board level, which is one reason why the policy implications of this are important. And, and those two board members provided consistent support and uh, sponsorship of, of this effort throughout. So after that initial meeting, we pulled together what came to be called the Coalition of the Willing. It was the group of people who said, yeah, this is important enough, we'll roll up our sleeves, we'll go to work on it. So before we organized the, the project at all, uh, we had a group of people looking at what's the research already out there. We don't want to necessarily duplicate it. We took a look at what challenges had been faced in prior circumstances, particularly with people trying to figure out how to transfer water either through or from the delta. Um, we came very quickly to understand that there was an enormous impact of microclimates in the delta because of the way it's been channelized, the way the winds operate, and particularly the difference in uh, the level versus water level at which farming occurs in the delta. It, it's, we needed more information on microclimates. I'll come back to how that impacted the study in a moment. And in that process, we identified that there were seven or eight well-documented, uh, peer-reviewed uh, methods for estimating consumptive use. So we kind of used the Coalition of the Willing to organize the study, and then we got people to volunteer to actually be involved in conducting the study. Our organizing principles was let's keep a broad array of stockholder or stakeholders in here because we wanted to maintain neutrality and credibility for what we came up with. We wanted to ensure that there was representation among lots of different interests who would ultimately be impacted by the findings of the study. And we wanted to keep people at the table by attracting skin in the game, get them to make investments. And so I mentioned that one of the things we recognized early on was we couldn't know enough about the microclimates in the Delta to draw a credible uh, resolution to some of these issues. And so one of the first things that we did, we went out to the Delta Water Agencies, the North, Central, and South Delta Water Agencies, and they actually contributed skin in the game. They funded 100% five new SIMA stations within the Delta. So we didn't have to, have to continue to work as we had in the past by SIMA stations that were on the periphery of the Delta where we kept getting the the, the feedback, yeah, but you don't know what it's like in the Delta. Now we do. And by the way, that's a gift that keeps on giving. Those are permanent new additions to the SIMA station network in the Delta. So they were bought by the, by the um, Delta water agencies, but now they're operated and maintained as part of the DWR SIMA station nationwide. So there are five new SIMA stations in the 250 uh, station network. And by the way, find, one of the reasons that there hadn't been SIMA stations in the Delta was because nobody in the Delta wanted the damn DWR uh, collecting data in their area. So by bringing the water agencies in and having DWR as a participant was really important to maintaining credibility and momentum throughout. The other thing is we decided we're not focusing on pure science. There's a lot of pure science that's been done. It's been developed. What we need to do is figure out practical applications and how we implement the information we already have. And then to make sure that it was all subjected to uh, collaboration among the seven different uh, teams, each of which was trying to improve their own methodology, uh, but to do so with peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer review. Uh, and that was important, as Jesse will talk about how we organized the study. 
among financial sponsors, we also wanted to go wide. Uh, these are all the agencies that were involved. The state board took the lead. This was about a half million dollar study when it was all done. Uh, and all these agencies participated at different levels, some in kind, some in cash. Uh, the, the state board was the lead agency in terms of cash. DWR was the lead agency in terms of kind. In terms of researchers, again, we went for a broad group. These are the people that are involved, several different uh, campuses of UC, several different division or departments within UC, uh, federal government through uh, uh, Agricultural Research Service and Ames uh, Research uh, Center. Um, several of the CSU campuses, and Land IQ is a, a private kind of cutting edge uh, land survey company, which made significant uh, significant benefits to that. So that's all about who was involved, how we organized it, and so forth. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jesse to talk about uh, how we organized the research and uh, how we took it to the next level. Quick question: Who is the ITRC? Uh, that's the Irrigation Technology Research Center at the uh, San Luis Obispo campus of uh, CSU Cal Poly. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, board members, Madam Chair. So once uh, we were finally able to gather together this coalition of the willing and we had these seven peer-reviewed model that, models that we are going to subject to comparison in this study, uh, the goal was to have separate sponsors for each of these models who were going to be involved in the process and be able to give us feedback and insights into their specific models. And those consisted of uh, two models used by DWR for water planning, uh, both statewide and specifically within the Delta. And then five of those models uh, from largely federal and academic institutions uh, use remotely sensed satellite imagery and data to develop these estimates of consumptive use. And included within the study was also a field campaign by the Land, Air, and Water Resources Department at UC Davis to capture field level data for calibration and comparison to these models in the Delta. And then as Michael uh, mentioned, Land IQ was contracted by DWR to conduct a land use survey uh, of annual land uses at a very small level on the Delta for every area. And uh, this was also supported by ground truthing by their firm, as well as independent QA and QC by DWR uh, prior to our release of the data to each of the modeling teams and our use of the data uh, to present the results within the study. Uh, and then we combined blind tests between these models as well as common data sets uh, used by each of them whenever possible. As Michael mentioned, the CIMIS station network and, and data provided with uh, additional stations within the Delta. And, and really those land use survey data and the CIMIS stations provide for cooperative benefits both to all of the study participants as well as the general public moving forward after this study and uh, presents just a really unique approach to bringing all of these uh, different folks together to collaborate. So the primary findings of the study when we get into what these models actually told us about consumptive use in the Delta is that the ensemble means, so that is the average annual consumptive use of all models for agricultural lands only, this is based on that uh, land use survey data, is about 1.4 million acre feet per year. Sorry, we have some strange formatting on these slides, but that's broadly pretty consistent uh, for the 2015, 2016 water years with DWR's water balance estimates for the Delta. And looking at differences between those models, uh, after collaboration in our multi-year study, all those methods were brought within 11%, in, in most cases much less than 11% of the mean above or below. However, the study did illuminate some systematic differences between these methods. There are different approaches that each of them use. There's input required by the, the modelers and judgment required and, and some of the input data sets. So we have a lot of valuable insights between these methods that uh, provide some opportunities for further uh, convergence between them, but may cause uh, systemic differences that are unavoidable. Uh, but overall, uh, the study certainly revealed that remote sensing 
methods and the models that we we compared and, and were developed for this uh, provide a very reasonable basis for accurately estimating crop ET uh, within the delta as well as other areas. And some additional insights is that this science is, is ever growing and the frequency and nature of observation from satellite data or even uh, UAVs, drones, is really growing and advancing rapidly. Uh, there are already several different planned missions for new satellites that will be launching to collect additional data that could be used by these types of methods. Uh, and then the application of these different models really can vary widely in the cost it took to establish them the expertise that's needed to, to run them and to fine tune their results, uh, the invasiveness, uh, how much they might impact uh, land use or things like that, the frequency of observation and what kind of level of data we get both uh, on a spatial scale, whether you go to a field or you go up to a county level, as well as how often, whether it be daily results or the monthly estimates that we compared for the two years of the study, and, and just the consistency uh, within their results and where they tend to agree more with the majority of the models uh, or the field data or not. And an additional part, again, the study was largely focused on agricultural lands and crop evapotranspiration, but one thing it also revealed is that a significant portion of consumptive use in the Delta is likely uh, consumed by non-agricultural lands. So this is open water, this is urban areas, as well as uh, what, what you could call natural vegetation, whether it be native or invasive uh, in riparian corridors or uplands. And it is an issue because many of these models are specifically tuned for agricultural lands and crops. So there is some more advancement of the science needed, but uh, it's certainly an important point to note that consumptive use could be impacted by uh, things like habitat restoration or, or wetland uh, activities that may not have been anticipated. Uh, absolutely. When you say significant, what kind of percentage ballpark? I won't pin you down to an exact, but I mean, uh -huh. what's the order of magnitude? Yeah, so if we look at the per unit uh, consumptive use, so you can measure that in, in feet, or it would be acre feet per acre. Uh, for example, alfalfa, corn, and pasture, which are the three predominant crops in the delta, are averaging in the range of about three to three and a half feet versus uh, things like the riparian vegetation or what they call upland herbaceous uh, showed from the models upwards of four to four and a half acre feet per acre. So that would be, so that you're thinking in terms of how much that particular use or physical use takes, not the total acreage in the delta. You can take it if you want. We did some calculations actually preparing the slide. Um, mm -hmm. About 30% of the total consumptive use of evapotranspiration in the delta is, is from non-agricultural. 30. And, and compare that to about 25% of the land area is occupied by those non-agricultural uses. So it's a little higher, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so beyond these uh, fi scientific findings of the study, there are a lot of important policy implications for putting this type of data and this nature uh, to use going forward. So I'll pass it over to Jay to discuss some of those. Thank you, good morning, Chair Marcus and board members. Um, I'm really here under false pretenses today. Um, I, sh I should be Josue Medellin, but, but he's uh, now a professor at UC Merced and he's teaching his last week of the first big cl undergraduate class. So he's undergoing way more stress than if we would be been here. Well, it's always um, fun to see you. Well, it's a pleasure but to be here. But tell him we're sorry we missed him. But he's, he's really the, the, the chief cat herder, along with Jesse, for, for much of this study. Uh, when you consider how, how many scientists had to be corralled and cajoled and encouraged and enticed to, to, to uh, collaborate in such, so many different diverse institutions. I think that's a tremendous accomplishment of the study and, and really quite a good example and lesson that it can be done. I, I figure if we can get researchers to collaborate, we can probably even get stakeholders to collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, so policy implications, there's a lot of policy implications I think for estimation of evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration is probably the biggest moisture water flux in, in, in our systems, uh, aside from precipitation, because most of it goes back up. Uh, it has relevance for uh, how we manage the delta, how we manage water transfers, 
how we do sigma accounting, how we do all kinds of water accounting for water rights and environmental flows and environmental restoration and everything. It's at the root of all of our evils. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't really like to estimate it. Uh, it's so hard to estimate and we have a lot of imbalances in it that we tend to do it by subtraction. We, we take the other numbers that we feel we know better and then we by subtraction we estimate, oh, that must have been ET. This, this approach is, has some limitations because it, it doesn't give us a little bit more sophisticated view of things. So um, this study has done, I think, an excellent job at de demonstrating the capacity and our incapacity of estimating crop ET at the field level by, by a wide range of methods and they, they, they differ substantially. Um, are these estimates close enough for government work? This is a phrase that was suggested to me by a government employee. I thought that was really good. Um, I'm still learning. <laughs> um, we will never get all these water balances exactly right. And it's, I think, an important policy decision about how, how do we go after these? Because if we don't manage with numbers, we're really not gonna be managed effectively at all. And we don't wanna get involved in endless discussions about the uncertainties. What is the process and the value of government, and particularly state government in this case, converging on one estimate or some way of estimating one estimate across agencies? We ran across probably five or six or seven different ET estimation programs funded by different units, different programs of state government often which didn't seem to talk to each other. Uh, this, this is a problem for us. And It'd be interesting to know at what cost. I, I'm sure there is some cost there. Yeah. N not only financially, but also in terms of our credibility and our insight to what's going on. And also in terms of indecision. Yeah, that's right. And we, agree we on can make, what it is. We can be indecisive <laughs> far more cost effectively, I'm sure. And, and I think, uh, how can we take scientific research and adapt it to practical use? Uh, I come from a profession which cultivates uncertainty. It's our job is to study it and, and mull it over and work with it and, and maybe try to reduce it over time, but also to find new ones. I mean, how, how do we take that important scientific research, which it will and should involve a lot of uncertainty, and hone it down for your applied policy purposes and necessary management purposes, uh, where often the uncertainty isn't that that important or can't be so overwhelmingly important. And then how can policy encompass these uncertainties and estimates? And then finally, how closely does crop consumptive use correlate with diversion measurement? I mean, for, particularly in the Delta where we have a lot of seepage coming in from groundwater, which really seeps in from surface water. Is that, is the diversion measurement really the relevant <coughs> accounting of of the diversion, the part of the diversion is, is over the top and some of it's through seepage, if you will. And there's what comes back. And there's what comes next. So we got a lot of things coming next. It's a nice study, we got a lot of smart people. Um, we have probably the most in extensive data trove of ET in the Delta for these couple of years that you could ever possibly imagine. Um, many years of master's theses and dissertations could come out of this. Um, Fortunately, we didn't delay this report for all of those. Um, I wouldn't be a good academic if I didn't report that more research is needed uh, to, to develop some of this and perhaps with some pilot studies, there are some pilot studies particularly on the way looking at consumptive use and fallow fields, some more specific field, field studies, which I think will be particularly useful looking at water transfers in and out of the Delta. And let me just say that that, that study uh, of uh, fallowed fields one of the things we recognized was we needed more information. That study is going on as we speak for the 2018 crop year, funded uh, one third by the water board, one third by the, well, I should say one fourth by the water board, one fourth by the federal contractors, one fourth by the state contractors, and one fourth in kind contributions by in Delta farmers. So we are getting that study uh, we'll have it this year. Again, widely peer-reviewed, broad uh, uh, group of interests uh, to create credible information on how much water you save 
when you fallow a field, keep it clear of weeds and keep it drained. And you're looking at different geographic areas in the Delta, but are you also looking, uh, or do you feel that you need to look at multi-year? Um, in the Delta, multi-year appears to make less of a difference because so much of the agriculture is done in such close proximity to surface water. So water availability doesn't seem to change as much from year to year in the Delta as it does in other areas. Mm -hmm. In fact, as we know from the uh, uh, the grape irrigators, one of the difficult things they have in the delta is how to do deficit irrigation in, within the delta. That's that has been a developing agricultural science uh, that's uh, you know developed a lot in the last just few years. There's a parallel research on how to develop remote sensing for non-crop water use, you know, particularly all the land, thousands of acres we're talking about restoring to wetlands. Um, wetlands being wet, evapotranspire water uh, up at fairly substantial rates. This study, I think, very usefully pointed out that and gave some initial estimates of it, uh, but I think there's still more work to be done on this. People have been trying to estimate crop ET for 100 years, uh, but we really haven't uh, thought about it so much for um, restoration sites. Uh, more scientific research uh, looking at practical field applications is an effort uh, that uh, the Nature Conservancy has been spearheading called Open ET that's looking at a variety of methods um, and a lot of continuing discussions in a lot of forums uh, as well as Open ET. And then looking at uh, the hypothesis of can we use remote sensing to augment diversion measurements, uh, maybe to make it cheaper easier, more consistent, more standardized than diversion measurements. Uh, as an engineer, I'd almost, you know, I'll, I'll accept maybe a little bit more error even in some ways, some average sense, just to have the same amount of error fairly standardized across mm -hmm. uh, the estimates. And to get the data in closer to real time so you can do something with it in the moment. Right. So it, there's, there's a lot of potential advantages for remote, remote sensing estimation of, uh, of ET. And the overall conclusion, we've made some really important progress on a gnarly problem. That must be a legal term. Um, but we still have a lot As of work As a Southern Californian, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> wicked, yeah, wicked. <laughs> so, uh, do you have any questions for us? Questions, I know there's a lot here. Well, just to uh, hear your thoughts on this. I mean, it seems to me that, I know. We, so we have the complaint before us that we've had for several years from the state um, uh, contractors, water contractors. Um, but this information, uh, as it's been uh, trickling out over a period of years, it just seems to me that it's crying out for voluntary agreements um, on uh, management options. And so just would like to hear your thoughts on that. So um, in order to have durable voluntary agreements, I think we need to have a reliable, consistent structure within which those uh, agreements can be negotiated and then monitored and refined. <clears throat> so one of the things that I think is exciting about this research and the application of this research is that I envision a day when we could post all this stuff on the web down to a field level. We can look at a field 30 meters by 30 meters from the satellites. We've got more satellites, more frequent observations. I believe that, the, that we are not far away from being able to post um, what I'll call as a lawyer, a rebuttable presumption of how much water is used by that crop in that field this year, maybe even just this week. And we'll be able to predict for next week and next year, for instance, when we know when a, an orchard has gone in, we can see that water use drops off from, let's say, the corn that was in that field last year, but we can now predict what it's gonna be as those trees grow over time. 
those are Im important tools that we haven't had before. The, the water consumptive use reporting that we get is for a calendar year, and it comes in in July. So we know, or will know, plus or minus July 1st, 2018, the water use reported by people in the Delta for calendar year 2017. That's useless in terms of making management decisions in a year where, you know, there are extremes. We all talk about average years. We've never seen one. We're always dealing with outliers. So what I see as, as the real promise here is the ability to say, here's what the water use is. We're going to be able to know how to, we've developed techniques for managing that in fairly real time on a crop year basis. Uh, I think that's where we get the application of the science to real world management of our most precious resource under circumstances that are so variable year to year. And, and when we've got that, <clears throat> now you can have voluntary agreements. You can have people say, <clears throat> I'll pass up growing corn this year to save a certain amount of water for the benefit of the system, and there will be a way to uh, manage that through a market, paying people for it or allowing people to take that water savings and apply it to their more valuable, let's say, tomato crop, or to, to, for a, a, a grape grower to buy out a tomato grower this year to keep those trees healthy and yet reduce overall water use. Those are, that's the kind of framework I think we need to have for those voluntary agreements to be able to work. We need to create a mechanism for doing the accounting and, and, and being kind of the honest data broker uh, rather than have each individual uh, choosing the one of these seven methods that shows their crop or their island to the best light. And how far off do you see that? Uh, Jay mentioned the Open ET project. Uh, it's a funded project. Um, you said it was uh, Nature Conservancy. It's actually the Environmental Defense Fund oh, is the sponsoring agency. It's funded primarily by uh, uh, philanthropic um, folks, uh, the Bechtel Institute, the Packard Foundation, et cetera. Um, I'm on the uh, steering committee for that, as is uh, Josue Medellin, the, uh, the real principal guy. investigator on this. Um, and, and the idea there is to take this research <clears throat> and to put it into an open, accessible, on your cell phone kind of app. Uh, that you can use. It depends upon government agreeing that this is this is good enough for government work. Uh, that it we'll have to come up with another phrase for it. But I did, it was a music <clears> for <throat> today. Exactly, and 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 so the more highfalutin term is the rebuttable presumption. Yeah, like this that. is what the water use is. If you've got better data, bring it in. Mm -hmm. Crowd correction. All of this is getting better. It got better from the time we started the study till the time we ended the study and it's continuing to, to gallop forward. So how much time? The Open ET project is a four-year project. Uh, it's funded for four years. At the end of that project, the expectation is that we will have a, an app uh, or accessible data for lots of people to create apps that will do different things. And so that this information should be usable by a farmer who's, who's making decisions about how much water to apply this week or next week, uh, which crops to grow based on uh, the annual hydrology. Uh, that is, put the information that's been QAQC'd at a, at a governmental level into the hands of people who make decisions on the ground. The other bit of negotiated agreements is, is this map. You can see how not only do things vary in time, but they vary a lot by locality. Um, and Jesse worked so hard on these maps, I had to show them. Um, <laughs> maps are good. <clears throat> and, and I think we also have to understand that 
as we go through these kind of negotiate agreements, which I, I agree is about the only way we can really do this in the long term, but the way we do it, I think is gonna be very important because we're gonna, as you start doing negotiate agreements, we're gonna find out all the problems because we will have a forum that, that, that brings them up. And as a researcher, I think that's actually good because we'll be able to learn more. But we have to structure those negotiate agreements and, and the governmental processes and the scientific processes to go along with them so that we actually do learn more as opposed to just talk more and complain more. So, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, just in follow up to that, um, and, and it also seems uh, to me that uh, this would help assist with some of the local entities that are already in existence in the Delta um, in terms of um, improved, um, well, maybe an enhanced role. That might be a better way uh, to describe it. I, I think a properly organized negotiated agreement on, on water rights uh, or, or environmental flows or other things would, would basically float all, all boats in the sense of, of better educating everyone about what's going on from everybody's perspective um, and, and basically build a confluence to, to, to bring a lot of that information together. And, and so that's one reason, um, Didi, that uh, there were so many state governmental agencies that participated in this that were on the oversight uh, group <clears throat> and you know put skin in the game and uh, we're going to the Stewardship Council to make a similar presentation to the Delta Protection Commission, to the Delta Conservancy, all of which put, you know, uh, hard-won budget dollars into this study. Um, and, and the hope and the expectation is that we will bring these groups together to look at consumptive use in the Delta through a similar prism and that that will cut down on some of the duplication, uh, reduce overall expenses, increase credibility, and increase consistency, and bring this down to a tool that you can use in real time, not just data that you get a year out of date. You know, that falls nicely out of a, a, a recent presentation you organized, uh, Mr. George, about uh, the difficulty and complexity of measuring diversions through siphons uh, in the delta, and I've joined you in the field to see that in full flower. Uh, some 92, 90 plus diversions on one island, for instance, and, and a different way of dealing with each almost. And so this seems compelling to get us to a level of doing a good, a proper accounting of quote unquote diversions through a, you know, a surrogate measurement that has been fully vetted and uh, has, has trust in standardization. Is that, is that where this trajectory is heading? Yes, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to think so. Obviously, we got a very important tool uh, as a trailer bill, SB88, at the end of, uh, or at the beginning of the growing season in 2015. We implemented it through regulations in 2016. That regulation essentially says, all diversions in excess of 10 acre feet per year need to have either a measurement device, uh, a measurement method, or if that's impossible to come up with an alternative plan of compliance. <clears throat> we have run into a lot of unexpected challenges in the Delta, and you're quite right, they're particularly related to um, siphons because we're taking water from a high water level and delivering it to fields at a lower level. We can use siphons. That's that's typical in the in the central part of the delta. Turns out that with fluctuations on the tidal side, with fluctuations, uh, uh, um, uh, turbulence within the pipe, uh, differences in diameters and all that, there's a lot of really difficult uh, problems with making that work. Not uh, not even mentioning the point that you made that on a single island you may have 50, 60, 90 uh, of these individual siphons. They're used not consistently throughout the year but from time to time and sometimes not all in every year. And so the notion of going out and, and measuring every one is significant in terms of time and expense. But the biggest issue that I've kind of grappling with today is the reliability of the data that we're going to get. 
because as a practical matter, as we learned in, in our field visit, um, there's a lot of uncertainty in every one of those measurements. Uh, if you've got 50 diversions around your island, you're probably not going to be able to do the kind of maintenance that you would like to do or that we would like to have. That data is going to come in piecemeal with a lot of uncertainty in it. So yes, if we could leapfrog that with data that is scrubbed and and scientifically based and gets the benefit of this crowd correction, um, we could get better data with less invasion at less expense that's timely for actual use. So I look at it more as a management tool, whereas the diversion measurement is more of a regulatory tool. It looks back, it's after the fact, we say there was an exceedance of your permits or something else, but at a time when all we can do is uh, correct for the future perhaps or punish for the past. Whereas what, we, what this technology promises is a way to deal with consumptive use of crops and potentially open water, invasive weeds, riparian vegetation in a way that is much more consistent, timely, and proactive. Yeah, and, and ultimately, I mean, let's, let's be honest, you know, we, we have to deal with being a regulatory body. You know, have to have a um, um, credibility in the water rights system and its administration. And, you know, with time and vetting these tools and standardization, a word I love to repeat over and over, uh, because it, it really helps break gridlock in many different areas we work in. Ultimately, this should feed into our administration of the water rights system. This should be a way for us to evaluate uh, compliance with water rights. You know, if, if it becomes this useful on a real-time basis, and it provides for course correction before we have to do, as you say, a, a year and a half later course correction, which always creates issues. So, I, you know, I, I'm really pleased to hear this. I wanted to get just really a little bit into the technical weeds since we have the technical experts here, and I really appreciate you taking the time. But um, I was, I found it really interesting to see, you know, the ultimate estimate based on these seven different ways of coming at it. It was about a million and a half acre feet. And isn't that not too far off from what we were, what our hypothesis was going in? And based on the subtraction work of the past and that sort of thing? I mean, do you have any comments on that? I, I've seen estimates of consumptive use between about 900,000 acre feet and two million. I mean, so... And, and a point I, I tried to make to the researchers as we were, you know, trying to get ourselves organized was, it, it, I, we're all used to estimates, errors in these estimates mm -hmm. for ET, but imagine that those estimates, those those errors are worth a thousand dollars an acre foot during a drought, because that's what it, people are hiring a lot of lawyers over this <clears throat> for that reason, um, and so that's the kind of atmosphere that that we have to. Be addressing. That's great. And also, I was just curious, because and thanks for um, letting the chair know about the the consumptive use of the different crops that you study. Because I, I was looking at that aspect of your summary, you know, something around three, three and a half acre feet per acre for alfalfa or corn mm -hmm. on the higher end, pasture a little bit less. How do those estimates compare to areas outside oh, of the delta? Question. I, I think, to my knowledge, I think those are broadly consistent with, with some of the other science. Um, several of these models were developed and tested in regions out, outside of the Delta. Uh, and I think, to my knowledge, that those are pretty consistent with, with some of those crops. Uh, but I think that we did expose some opportunities for further work, specifically in the Delta, due to, like Michael was saying, these, these microclimates and wind fluctuations and temperature uh, fluctuations and being very close to a lot of these open water channels can, can certainly impact the ET. That's right. And um, clearly, you know, if we're talking about Imperial County, mm -hmm. we're going to have yeah. a different acre feet per acre mm -hmm. uh, with alfalfa, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's interesting because it's probably not too far off necessarily your hypothesis, but having these measurements to verify it, isn't that the essence of what a huge achievement of this effort? that now there's buy-in to these estimates. And, and, and also, 
when you take when you aggregate the data and you come up with averages for uh, by definition uh, alfalfa across the delta, what this research demonstrates is the difference in alfalfa from north to south, from uh, 20 feet below sea level to 10 feet above sea level. So when we aggregate, when we talk about the average for the delta, it is, as Jesse says, you know, it, it, the, the noise is kind of averaged out, but that noise is really important. That's what we're trying to get at. What is the ET of that crop in that field at that elevation with those wind conditions? That's valuable insight and understanding that we couldn't have without these tools. And, and if I may, um, going back to, to Jay's answer about saying that 1.5 million acre feet is fairly consistent with estimates, that's still kind of treating the delta as this black box where we only have the ET coming out. I think this map really shows that the value in this data is looking at certain times of the year, certain crops, certain areas of the delta. We have these kind of subdivided regions, central, north, south, and you can see there's kind of these hot spots of ET around uh, the Yolo Bypass, where there's a lot lower ET down in the, the southwest delta. So I think uh, going into looking at the diversion reporting and things, that's where this, this data is truly useful, is on uh, much finer time and spatial scales. You don't, you don't need that finer scale for all of the policy decisions you look at, all the management decisions, but you do for some, some of the water transfer things in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very exciting. And it's, it's, uh, do you feel that this is one of the cutting edge efforts to be a proving ground for remote sensing data to um, be a surrogate for diversion data? Well, I, I told Dr. Lund that he was not allowed to use the uh, Idaho experience, but I, I'll give him a dispensation to answer the question. So the state of Idaho, which, which is much smaller and much simpler, they have what, four crops, we have 400, mm -hmm. um, but they do have several million acres. Um, they use remote sensing to do their water rights administration instead of having farmers report. Maybe they might have report in addition, but, but uh, that's the primary way that they ad administer surface water or water rights. Did they do that as an overlay or was that part of the agreement when they did the adjudication on the Snake River? I think it uh, is before the adjudication. Oh, it, was, it was. It probably facilitated I, I was going to say it was required for the adjudication that's and that's people right. agreed that that's how they were going to keep score through the adjudication. I should also say, and the reason I, I told Dr. Lundy wasn't allowed to mention Idaho is the, uh, the primary remote sensing technology called metric was developed by uh, Dr. Allen at the University of Idaho as a precursor, as a requirement by the special master in the uh, Snake River adjudication. Hmm. And it was funded by the state. Everybody agreed that this is how we're going to do it. Now, I, the reason I said we shouldn't mention that is because it is so much simpler in Idaho, mm -hmm. uh, but also because they started using this 20 years ago. 1998 is the, is, was the seminal uh, peer-reviewed study by Dr. Allen. Um, it's a lot different today than it was 20 years ago. The acuity that they have today is m much finer. And, and I think for use in California, much more complex circumstances, mm -hmm. we need that 20 years of, and probably another three or four years of development. So good to have a parallel approach of measuring diversions and doing remote sensing. We tried to be good scholars in this report and look for other parts of the world that might have done comparison studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and we found one. Uh, Turkey. In Turkey, and we found another in, in South America where they had another. Mediterranean another's. climate. Yeah, some places in South America have Mediterranean climate. And uh, I think this is as advanced as any of those, probably more so, I think. That's helpful. Yeah. I've, I've been asked, by the way, by... Uh, uh, the Water Authority of Spain to come and give them a, 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 a report. Uh, so I'm currently going through the out-of-state travel process. You need a board member to join you. <laughs> <laughs> Chaperone, supervisor. Well, that's great. And so, yeah, just I'm very excited about it because I, I feel so convinced that water budget approaches are the key to California's water future. And, and having measurement approaches that have um, validity and trust 
uh, are a, a key component of that. And so I, I think this is really important work. And I thank you for uh, gathering, a cat, or herding the cats, as we say, on the research front, but also uh, the, the local agencies and the state agencies as well. I, I'm very excited about this. If, if I could offer one last sort of thought is that given the range of, of uses for this kind of data, this kind of information, and, and the inherent variability and in, in local variability and, and variability in methods, uh, I think it does merit a coordinated effort to bring the state programs that work on ET together to have one public, open, peer-reviewed mm -hmm. effort to inform the state agencies, to, to bring the state agencies together on this, um, rather than it continuing to go in a rather entropic way. Well, that's where all of your peripatetic briefings will be helpful. Bring in urban, ag, natural, open space, as you point out, is significant and important for accounting. Yeah. Sounds and, good. And when it comes to the open ET effort, is it ready for that sort of multi-agency sort of collaboration, or do we still, do you feel need you know, a couple more years for the open ET effort to get to a point where... We have this problem in all sorts of areas where we're trying to estimate mass balances or anything technical. It's never ready. <laughs> and it never gets to be ready until you start using it. Sure. So I think it's more about how do you start using it in a way that, that's judicious and, and cautious and reasonable and, and sort of peer-reviewed and you know, right, well and done can see rather it. than, oh, we're just gonna wait until it's ready. Because if you say that, then it's, there's no motiva motivation to focus and have it be ready. Or to claim it's fully cooked and we're going to apply it ruthlessly. I think we got to approach this with a little bit of humility uh, and learn as we go. But I agree. We need to roll this out. We need to get people using it, testing it, coming back to us. We've got a wonderfully broad user community that understands what we've done here and all of the different methods and mechanisms have strengths and weaknesses. We never tried to create a beauty contest here and say this is the best one. What we tried to do was get them all to be better and then to develop a way that we could converge on numbers that we can use to manage. And they'll get better over time and that's part of what we have to acknowledge. The sociological design of the study was probably the most important innovation I think we get out of this. Yeah. Seems pretty brilliant. Our, our water rights uh, division looking at pilot testing it in some way? Uh, we've worked very closely with the Division of Water Rights and with the Sigma implementation group. So we're, this is focused on the Delta, which is the most difficult, complicated part of it. But this is clearly a tool that is going to be used to understand water balances in uh, uh, sustainable groundwater management basins uh, around the state. When you know what the ET is and you know what the surface water application is, the difference generally in upland farming is groundwater. So this is a mechanism we have worked uh, uh, very closely. Uh, we had the Division of Water Rights, uh, Barbara Evoy, the uh, groundwater management group led at the time by Eric Ekdahl and me, uh, these were the three agencies within the State Water Source Control Board that sponsored this and pushed up, got the funding, and, and got this off. And again, thanks to uh, Board Member Dodek and Board Member Spivey Weber, who, who gave us that kind of overall board level mantle to, to move this forward. I think this is great, and thank you for all of the care and thought and time. I want to say blood, sweat, and tears as well um, in doing it, but you're, I appreciate the approach. I like approaching it with humility, but also seeing it as a, an iterative process. And um, I, what I really want to ask, but I will hold off given the time, and I might have to buy you a beer to do it, is I do want to understand how this helps in all the warring factions and their assertions about each other. The is so is not your jerk, no I'm not level of discourse that's characterized who's taking whose water in the delta and how this might help. But Good, at least get data that everybody can um, look at and then argue about the real facts rather than their own facts. And I think that'll be, that's a, uh, will be a great advance for everybody, even if they have to change their talking points a little bit. 
I think um, it'll be a, a good thing. And so uh, we'll save that one. Um, but thank you. And we'll look forward to you coming back and telling us how all these conversations went and what you what you learn. I suspect some of us are going to want to dive into more of those weeds um, about stuff. Because it just even looking at these maps, there's all kinds of interesting questions about what's there and what the correlation is, et cetera. Yeah. So I'll look forward to that. Hmm? Thank Probably you. Very much. Happy to talk to you. Good. Yeah, I like that. All right. Thank you very much. I think that's uh, that was terrific. First of many conversations. Um, great. Um, board member reports. And then just to notice, we, we will postpone the personnel um, item because we have a hard stop on that at 1 o'clock. So when we're done with board member reports, we'll take a 15-minute break and then move into our other closed session item on water fix. So you can grab some food. So board member reports. I'll just calendar. mention that um, I was able to get out to Washington D.C. for Water Week, uh, which was oh, great, great to be able to be out there with um, you know so many of the various water professionals that were out there. There was a number of great briefings. Was able to sit in on one that I would definitely want to highlight is um, there was a joint uh, tri caucus briefing on the House side that was put together by the SFPUC and a number of other utilities to talk about workforce development. Um, you know, I think. Uh, the, Various uh, studies peg it at about 36% of the workforce retire in the next 10 years um, in the water and wastewater sectors. So, in, you know, as we saw today with uh, the fifth, fifth and sixth graders that were before us, it's important to engage um, uh, uh, students early and uh, about the opportunities within water. And then also uh, there was discussion about um, there's some creative thinking, thinking happening, uh, kind of copying models from other sectors about how do we get sort of universal certifications out there so that people can easily transfer around within the water sector itself. Um, you know, an example is the fact that, you know, in the healthcare industry, say a radiologist in one state can then go and uh, apply there, you know, you apply for jobs, be able to work in, in other states. And it's because of sort of universal credit accreditations there. So how do we, how do we work with community colleges? How do we work with the educational institutions, the sec, the, um, the water sector, the wastewater sector to come up with what are those core competencies for, you know, 21st century workforce essentially. And we here at the board obviously have, uh, we do uh, op operator certifications, but, you know, what are the other opportunities that, you know, we have within our own purview to create that sort of commonality. And so there's, it was, it was a, a great uh, panel to, to be able to listen in on and um, definitely want to continue to follow up with staff about that. And, and I know we've had other discussions about a board internship program. How do we get a sort of a, a program at the board that is, you know, an umbrella program where uh, folks that come through scholarships or other internship opportunities can come and have sort of a, a standardized, if you will, experience with us at the board for a program and also have paid internships. And I know that's something that Eric has been working on with staff and excited for just continue to explore those opportunities. Um, you know, the, 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 the challenge is huge when it comes to filling that workforce. Mm -hmm. um, the, the nature of jobs is such now that, you know, folks kind of come in for a few years and maybe leave the, the days of sort of sticking with one company for, you know, or one, one utility for 30 years is, is less so. So how do we, how do we, how do we as a sector kind of adapt to some of that? And we internally see that as well with retirements within our own staff. So um, it was, it was a, a great discussion to, to That's great. In. A lot of great people were there for that too. So that's good. Anything? Just a <clears throat> heads up to Jonathan and DWQ that since Waterfix is sort of in a break right now, I will be turning my attention to water quality matters, including the long overdue dredge and fill policy and toxicity policy. And I also want to get an update on CV salts because that will be coming before the Central Valley Regional Water Board, I believe, in June. So I will be bugging you a lot. We anticipated that, and so I'm trying to get briefings uh, offered for all um, for the next two weeks on all of our major uh, policies, so that you all that are um, otherwise engaged most of the time can have an opportunity to have a more detailed discussion. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, on April 19th, I attended the North Coast Regional Water Board meeting in Weed, California. 
where there well, were... that's your favorite place. And I got the chance to go to some ranches out there. Uh, Sierra Pacific Industries um, has a few ranches and um, some multi-agency, uh, multi-benefit projects for water control structures, which, you know, engineering in the ranch landscape. Sometimes it's a little discordant visually and yet beautiful in its own way because it makes water available for the ranchers more of the year and um, creates barriers so that fish don't get entrapped into ponds and things like that. Simple issues that, but it was amazing. The universal appreciation for these projects from all points of view up there in Siskiyou County. So um, we hope to continue to help fund those through 319H and other uh, programs out of our shop, but uh, thanks to the North Coast Regional Board uh, and um, and the other agencies, Fish and Wildlife and NOAA Fisheries, et cetera. So really successful projects up there that contribute to the Klamath Basin uh, improvements. Um, there are also folks in the city of Weed that are concerned about some of the, the water, the bottled water issues. And so they, they used a lot of the public forum to talk about that and the North Coast mm -hmm. board members listened and I listened. On April 23rd, we had our annual meeting of the Regional Water Board Chairs here, and uh, it was uh, well attended by all the regions. Uh, and uh, we uh, had a, a great discussion with the governor's office, um, them showing their appreciation for our work, but also just we appreciated hearing from them on their initiatives that they're continuing to work on with water conservation and safe drinking water. And Secretary Rodriguez was there and gave a great overview of all the issues that you know, have been around a long time, uh, but but also where we made substantial progress. So it was nice to hear from him directly because he's very conversant in our water issues and wants to set the stage for the, you know, the next administration and continue momentum in, in these multi areas that uh, is appreciated. Uh, on April 25th, um, this the group California Watershed Network, they have a meeting usually here in the Klamath Room um, and there are a nice diversity of um, membership uh, includes RCDs, resource conservation districts, nonprofit organizations, uh, municipalities, water districts, and, um, and a whole range, uh, flood control districts, folks from Contra Costa were there. Um, a good group of folks that they often will um, participate in our grant and loan programs to do watershed restoration. And uh, so they wanted to hear from uh, me about regulatory challenges of doing restoration, you know, and you've heard us talk even at WQCC about wetland restoration, you know, it's we're, our system is set up for defense, not offense, you know, in terms of going out there and changing landscape for environmental benefits. So that was kind of the, the crux of my remarks, but I also pointed out thanks to staff input from the regions and here at the state board about ways we've improved our regulatory process and we even heard today ecological restoration uh, for wetland permits is a discount in the fee, for instance. So there's a number of things we're trying to do, general permits on small habitat restoration projects. That's been connected to recent legislation, AB 2190, which compels Fish and Wildlife to issue permits within 30 days when they uh, comply with the conditions of our mm. permit, which is linked to CEQA in terms of the categorical exemption. So. All these, there are a lot of tools that we have available to these folks who don't have time or money to hire a, a consultant necessarily to get the funds and get the pr projects in the ground at limited resources. So we had a good discussion. And then at that uh, annual watershed at the Capitol Day, we also heard from Jerry Merrill, uh, the Natural uh, Heritage Institute, but he's worked on and gave a nice overview of the, of the upcoming proposed water bond in November's ballot. And it's it's quite sizable. It's it's on the same level as Prop One from a couple of years ago, uh, and a lot of watershed-related infrastructure that's uh, contemplated in that proposal. So I encourage you all to to check up on on that. That not to be confused with the June ballot, which is the Parks and Water and Wildlife. So anyway, it was good to hear from Mr. Merrill as well. And that's it for my update. Thanks. Oh, that's great. So the only thing I have to report on is that I attended part of the chair's meeting and thought you did a really good job. And um, I um, I just was fortunate to be there and to listen in on a really interesting topic. And uh, that has to do with um, industrial stormwater and trying to bring some of the non-filers into the system. And so um, Irma Munoz from Region 4, 
Um, it seemed to me that, uh, from what I understood, uh, that she reached out to some of the municipalities that um, were not real happy with the stormwater permit and wanted to better understand what the challenges were for them in terms of cost and otherwise. And uh, this led to um, a coalition over at Region 4, uh, California Metals Coalition, LA Waterkeeper, uh, SA Recycling, um, along with some of the municipalities in particular, the city of Glendora and the mayor that uh, participated in this panel. And I was surprised to hear how high the rate is of um, non-filers um, in this area. Uh, they estimated somewhere between 50 and 60%, recognizing that's not statewide, more than likely in you know certain regions. Um, yeah, pockets, better way to describe it. Um, but um, they're... Um, you know, pulling this coalition together and trying to figure out um, ways to increase um, participation and tied to the business licenses. And so, um, uh, you know, real um, uh, simple thing, good idea that just hadn't been done before. And so uh, uh, kudos to uh, Irma Munoz for putting that together. Yeah. Right. What was neat there was um, independently we had been approached by the Department of Motor Vehicles with it, their new um, assembly bill authority for conditioning their licensing of those uh, auto dismantlers and, and auto recyclers. So it was a convergence of good ideas. Irma Munoz's leadership um, recognizing an opportunity to deal with the non-filer issue, but also now we have this new tool and a new ally uh, in the Department of Motor Vehicles to to link up with our regional board administered programs. In the end, water quality benefits from this, you know, because it's, I think we, I was struck by, uh, for lack of a better term, a whack-a-mole reality to this, that mm -hmm, yeah. there will always be dismantlers and recyclers that will pop up that are below the radar, even with oversight. So there has to be a constant vigilance within all of these different, you know, limited resource state agencies. Well, but, just, but a partnership was key to, for us to get ahead of it somehow. And to bring in the, um, those that are complying, you know, just to level the playing field. Absolutely. I think it's as important for that as anything else. And it's, but it requires more creativity and work to do as opposed to just cracking down on the folks who come in voluntarily. That's why I tend to be pushy about the non-filer stuff, even though it's more complicated, just because it's fair. It's more fair. No, I think that's great. Well, great work. I don't have anything new to uh, report. I look forward to my water quality days. Add, add bacteria to Tam's list. Uh, yeah, thank you. I'll think about where what's on my list. There are things. Um, all right. Well, with that, I suggest that we resume at 115. 110? Let's say 115. I need to caffeinate too. What one fifteen in uh, upstairs or is it upstairs or in here? Two thirty. Conference okay. room two thirty, okay. and that will only be to meet on the water fix closed session. Right. There will be no personnel closed session today. Thank you.